This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Thirty A paragraph twenty allows us to hold this virtual town meeting. I'll call upon each counselor by name, and please make sure at that point you unmute your mic, but then mute it after you say you are present. This will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. Uh, this is also how we will deal with counselor comments throughout the agenda. Please use the raise hand function. So I'm going to start with the roll call. And I'm going to start with Shalini Balmilne. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Present. Lynn Griesmer. Present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Okay. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I call the August 31st, 2020 meeting of the council to order at 6, oh, 632. Just two seconds, I need to all right. Um, the meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It also is being recorded. There is no chat room for this meeting. If there are technical issues, please let Serge or Athena know, or make let me know. Uh, to make a comment or ask a question, please use the raised hand button. Um, and if we have to pause the meeting because of tech technical difficulties, we will make a note of that in the minutes. Um, Athena and Serge will be monitoring counselor connections and that's how we will proceed with the meeting. I wanna just quickly ask that we put the announcements up. Um, I just wanna start by announcing, this is actually not a special meeting of the town council, but a regular meeting of the town council. It really makes no difference since we're planning to have public comment anyway. I want to call attention to the two items up here. The first one is the new COVID concerns hotline and also the fact that you can email town government with your concerns. In addition to that, the UMass is holding a public or community forum on this Thursday at September 3rd at 530 and the information about that is on the front page of the town of the town's website. Um, let me move quickly to the order of the agenda. There is only one period for public comment. We're not to that yet, Serge, so please take it down. Take the whole thing down. Thank you. Um, there's only one period for public comment. It will be at the beginning of the meeting. There are two items listed under topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair, 48 hours in advance of the meeting, and they are listed as 14A and 14B. One 14A is regarding planning board and 14B is a reconsideration of the zoning bylaw 11.250. We will start with items 8A and B after public comment, then move to 7A and B. And then we will take a break and I will assess where we are with the agenda and decide whether or not there are items that will be moved to September 14th. And also the placement of the executive session. So with that, uh, I would like to ask anybody who would like to make public comment to please raise your hand. And let me just say, you are welcome to express your views for up to, I'm gonna say three, well, I need to see who all wants to speak. Is 
Is that all the people who would like to speak tonight? Okay, I'd like you to keep your comments to two minutes of prep, if at all possible. Uh, we'll start with Zoe Crabtree. Please come in, state your name, and if you would like to take your screenshot off, you can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Zoe. Hi, uh, my name is Zoe Crabtree. I'm in District 5, um, and I'm just uh, calling uh, today to um, speak out in favor of the proposed uh, recommendations and edits to the GOL goals for the town manager that uh, the Racial Equity Task Force put together. Um, I believe that you've received them um, over email, um, and they were also talked about in the Amherst Indy. Um, and the, the general overview, if you haven't read them yet is that it is important to weave uh, racial equity goals throughout each of the town's goals um, as opposed to having a separate one um, and also that if there are goals about racial equity that they need to be attached to things that are uh, specific and measurable um, which i think is really important as well so that's why i wanted to say tonight thank you thank you just for your information the um, piece of information that was provided by us but by the Racial Equity Task Force, I believe is in our packet. Um, Gabrielle? Hi, uh, I am introducing the Racial Equity Task Force of Amherst's response to the Council's goals for the Town Manager Fiscal Year 21. The Town Manager goals for Fiscal Year 21 document lists policy goals and management goals. Rather than relegating race and equity to a one issue area, weaving the lens of racial equity and social justice into every policy and management goal will provide a starting point for a substantive inclusion of BIPOC residents, as well as those of other marginalized groups into the town management and governance. This entails asking how the climate action, community health and safety, economic vitality, major capital investments, housing affordability, and racial equity and social justice goals are informed by what the data, both qualitative and quantitative, in addition to resident testimony about their experiences, uh, about the experiences, assets, and needs of BIPOC and vulnerable residents of Amherst for every goal area. Such a revision could begin by using existing sources, both individual and institutional. Local and regional agencies have already concluded, ha have already conducted interviews with Amherst residents, as well as documented some of our experiences, assets, and needs. At this stage, committing in writing to an inclusion of qualitative and quantitative data about BIPOC residents and seeking to answer the question of how each policy area will address these findings would suffice. Let's not allow perfectionism to become the enemy of progress. Uh, if it were possible for Demetrius Shabazz to follow me with the second section, we would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We can do that. Dimitri. Hello. Hi. Thank you, yeah, thank you again. Um, I'm going to sum up the specifics of the racial equity and social justice goals that we included. Um, it includes the formation of a council of BIPOC residents with the budget and authority to hold public meetings and invite the participation of BIPOC residents from all walks of life in a format that includes people of all socioeconomic e educational strata and of all abilities, language interpretation, needs for transportation and childcare. Also the participation of council members and the town manager is required to, be, uh, to have anti-bias and anti-racism training provided by a third party and we would like to include that a majority of council of BIPOC residents that would be on a contract review committee to be a part of this. Um, then thirdly, we want that the council members and the town manager in meetings with the council of BIPOC residents with the goal of examining racial inequities and injustices via both qualitative and quantitative data and through facilitated dialogue and testimony. We also would like that the Council of BIPOC residents oversee funding for youth programming in the short term and planning for a cultural center in the, in the long term. We also would like to see the Council of BIPOC residents pursue other specific programming ideas that we've uh, proposed through conversations, but we'd like to get them formally written. 
The goal of community health and safety should be expanded to include reshaping the culture of policing and a commitment to shifting funding from the town budget away from policing in a manner that not only addresses social issues, but that ensures anti-racism training and community dialogues and that they continue including the creation of a civilian review board and the ability to highlight instances of differential treatment and enforcement. If now um, I could call on Isolde, uh, we'll uh, continue with the document. Is that uh, possible? I will recognize Isolde. Good evening, thank you so much. Um, the town manager goals for FY21 document also lists management goals. These are especially critical goals in which to weave in racial equity and social justice. They involve the day-to-day -day business of governance and create institutional barriers for the participation of BIPOC and other vulnerable residents. For example, the goal area of administration, leadership, and personnel management includes, quote, retaining, recruiting, and developing a highly qualified, diverse, and effective staff, but does not include numerical goals um, there's not a way to measure the outcome without a by, uh, by um, baseline and a goal. And uh, we also uh, notice that there is not a, a reference to multilingual, bilingual, bicultural staff who would also receive training. The long-term vision management uh, goal does not include racial equity and social justice. And so we don't think that it can see results of expanded participation in civic life and an enriched and just community life without that lens. Um, moving on the community engagement goal, if it weaved in racial equity and social justice, we would ask questions such as, how are BIPOC people, speakers of languages other than English, people with various disabilities, financial insecurity, varied documentation status, formerly incarcerated people, people suffering housing insecurity, LGBTQ people and other vulnerable communities empowered and supported in community participation and leadership. There's also an interesting goal around the relationship between the town council and many residents. We could say that that relationship is at a crossroads. On the one hand, there's been real damage done in recent weeks. On the other hand, communication has greatly increased um, how does the town manager contribute to expanding rather than contracting local democracy and community participation would be a question for that goal. Um, ultimately, in order to strategically elevate racial equity and social justice in the town governance and administration to advance an agenda and distribute the workload of the town manager, capacity could be expanded. And we would recommend hiring a chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. However, despite the media's emphasis today on this one bullet out of two pages, uh, clearly what we're talking about here is a paradigm. We're talking about a lens and a way of looking at all policy areas through the lens of racial equity and social justice, which are not solely dependent on one position, though such a position would be an ultimate goal. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you for your comment. Harry Mullen. Hi, uh, my name is Terry Mullen. I live in District uh, 4. Um, I'm also speaking on behalf, uh, in support of the Racial uh, Equity Task Force uh, demands and what to, to add to the town councilor's goals and how to um, weave in racial equity work at every level of the goals. Um, I also would really like to see uh, more clear ways to uh, gather data and um, uh, work at clear goals to gather such data. Um, it seems like just doing some basic Google searches that there are packets from the National League of Cities on how to collect data. There's um, uh, three colleges in town, all with math and statistics departments who I'm sure would be willing to talk to you about how to collect data appropriately. There's the uh, UMass has even more resources uh, in terms of social justice um, data collection or social data collection, I should say rather. Hopefully you would use it for justice. I think you can. 
Um, so yeah, so those are just some suggestions of places to look on, on how to collect this data. I know it's a big job, but I really think this town is, is well equipped to do it, especially with all the um, uh, movement that we've seen in the, in the, in the past couple of weeks. So, and thank you for respecting the, the racial equities task force uh, uh, effort to uh, speak in, in succession. That was, that was really nice. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Terry. Um, Anita Sorrow. Anita, can you unmute and make sure that you state your name and where you live? Can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Thank you. Um, I'm new to this and I don't have prepared comments, but I did want, want to speak up in, in support of the recommendations from uh, the uh, Racial Equity Task Force. And I think I speak as an ally of the BIPOC community. Um, I, I think that, that um, the goals as or the recommendations that they've made are very coherent, very important, and I, I hope you accept them all. And I hope that this is the beginning of a, of a process. Um, I think we all learned, um, especially from the most recent issues, especially the um, uh, consolidation, the proposal for consolidation of uh, voting sites, that everything that comes before you, everything, every decision that is made um, can have ramifications that are unexpected or unnoticed when they're first talking about it. So I would just ask that you consider these recommendations as the beginning. I, I hope you adopt them, um, uh, but as the beginning of a process, and I would ask you to consider that every decision and every project and every matter that affect the town should be put through that lens that Isolde was mentioning about, you know, how does this decision have the effect um, on uh, BIPOC citizens, on um, uh, people made vulnerable and marginalized by any disability, men mental illness, lack of adequate housing, all of those. Um, it, I, I would suggest that you think almost in terms of a, a just as environmental impact statements are considered before any projects that um, uh, that this kind of, of lens can be used for everything that you do. So um, just wanted, wanted to uh, voice my uh, strong support um, of this measure. And I hope it's the beginning of some fundamental and long overdue changes in our town. Thank you. Thank you, Lita. Um, Kathleen Traphagen. Hi, thanks for letting me speak. And thanks for all the work that you do um, every day. And thanks to the members of the Racial Equity Task Force for all the work that they have done to put together a super comprehensive set of recommendations that we, um, I think from the white ally community are learning from them every day. Um, that's really graciousness on their part to continue to teach us uh, what we need to know in order to move forward to advance racial equity in this town. And um, I definitely want to second what the last commenter just said about adopting the package of recommendations that they have put before you in whole, um, because they are well put together, they are comprehensive, and um, they each one of them means something altogether. So thanks again for your time. And thank you again to the Racial Equity Task Force. There's somebody with the name of MFAIA faculty. Would you please come in and state your name and where you live? Hi, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> my name is Zhu Pong Lin. I'm uh, apparently have entered the meeting with my, uh, my work um, Zoom account. Um, I live in Amherst. I'm a fairly new member of the Amherst community, although <laughs> I think I've been living here for three years, but um, I think that's still considered fairly new. Um, I, I'm a naturalized citizen. Um, 
born in Taiwan and my first language was Hokkien. And so I just wanted to say that as part of my context and really appreciate Isolde's comments about um, wanting to see a more multilingual, multicultural staff um, at work in, in Amherst, uh, a town that, you know, prides itself in being welcoming to a diverse population. Um, I can't say that that's been my experience, that, that it's been welcoming to a diverse population. I see, I rarely see Asians in leadership roles in the town. And I know myself, I've avoided involvement in this level of government um, because I haven't felt represented or that I have a voice. But I have been um, involved, beginning to be involved with the Amherst Racial Equity Task Force, and I want to really thank them and all the people um, for that have been involved in in putting forward this proposal. And um, I want to voice my strong support of their work. Um, I think that the town council, when I look on the screen and see who is um, representing all of us citizens of Amherst, um, you have some work to do. It's, it's, you know, this is not a, this is not a very diverse group. Um, I fully support directing greater resources to supporting black indigenous and people of color, disabled people, the homeless community and other marginalized and vulnerable communities. And I, I also want to add that I'm a member of the board of the startup food co-op, the common share food co-op. And I strongly believe that food justice is a public health issue. It's a public health emergency. It's an eco justice concern. And I find it unacceptable that parts of Amherst are defined by the EPA as food deserts. And I put that in quotes. I, I have some critique or issues with the term food desert, but um, but it's you know a useful term to note that there are places in Amherst where um, people don't have access to healthy food. And people who don't have access to um, you know cars, it takes it takes a long time. It sometimes can take a whole day to get to a grocery store. So I want to call on the town council to support the food co-op, the mobile market, and other projects that are working towards food sovereignty, because I think that's um, that's a big issue that is a barrier to, um, you know, really supporting a thriving community in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Waylon Greeny? Hi, good evening. My name is Huelin Greeny and I live on 76 McClellan Street. And tonight I want to bring your attention to the uh, appointment process for planning uh, board members. I have attended um, town meetings in 1995 and was a uh, select board from 2005 to 2008. And in my tenure participating in town government, uh, planning happened to be one of my interests. And the reason I'm interested in it is because that I work with people who are homeless, struggling with housing. So the lack of affordable housing is very apparent. And I'm sure that every one of you is very aware and supportive of affordable housing. However, when it comes to the reality, we all have our pet peeves. So some of you might, like me, I have my favorite child of, of the four children and you have your favorite positions that you take. And when you appoint members, you might appoint people that you feel you have uh, some similarity. So therefore you would advocate for a certain member being appointed. And that comes to the territory as a human being. And I want to recognize that. However, in my participation of town government, I realized there are instances where uh, when the town manager used to be the appointing body for a planning board. And then over the years, when I witnessed uh, the town itself 
uh, have the preference for a certain um, interpretation of the town bylaw such that uh, the downtown development is in favor of developers to the extent I also witness there are planning board members who are not appointed because of the position they have in terms of development or not in favor of huge development. So all that preference is expressed in my participation. I really want to come out this time to say to you, we have our preferences when it comes to a child, but we all know we represent all of them, that we love all of them. So I want to urge you when you discuss tonight about uh, the planning board appointment discussion, please realizing that you represent all of us. Some of us prefer big development because that might help us lessen our tax burden as homeowners. But some of us, we prefer small meaningful development because we want to make housing affordable and that we feel a small desegregated development is more likely to bring forth affordable housing. So therefore that I as the spouse of one of the candidates who apply for the planning board member three times for seven positions. And I am not gonna be bashful to say that my husband, Bob Greeny has been very dutifully working hard to prepare the statements and express in action for participating in town government elections and for thinking about how the planning can be done to preserve the tax base, to preserve affordable housing, and to preserve the small town charm, the small town charm. However, because of his standing in favor of meaningful small development, in my mind, has contributed to his applying three times and not being appointed. And that really bring out my bad memory of one of our old planning board members. She was not appointed because she was deemed as yeah. not able to work with others. So yeah. for this, I want to ask you to please, in your discussion tonight, to think about that you as a parent representing all of us, you have your favorite child, but you are here to love all your children and to provide the best for them. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your discussion in 14A and 14B. Robert Greeny, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I'm gonna read a prepared statement. I, I feel compelled to say I, I did not know Wei Ling was gonna talk. <laughs> Anyway, I have some prepared comments. Uh, tonight, the town council will consider the recommendation of the CRC for the appointment of three new planning board members. Our current planning, one current planning board member who applied for reappointment is not included in the recommendations. I urge the town council not to approve those recommendations. Since the new town council began, there have been two previous instances of town council approval of planning board appointments. Tonight is the third time in 15 months that the council will consider a list of recommended candidates. I am familiar with the process in all three cases because in all three cases, I was among the candidates interviewed and considered for appointment much detail that time does not permit, but the most striking feature to be considered in your deliberations is the following. In the first instance, May 2019, the four recommendations put before the council included three current members for reappointment and one new member, Janet McGowan. You may recall the long debate followed a motion to not approve the four recommendations. The main point of contention was whether or not the fourth person should be Greg Stutzman, the current 
the, the then current chair who had served the recommended limit of two terms. This motion was not approved and a second motion to approve was made and passed. It is striking and demands explanation that at that time, many counselors thought reappointment so important that out of four openings, not a single one be a new member. In stark contrast, tonight, you will be asked to approve three new members who have not previously applied for planning board positions instead of the normally automatic reappointment of a current member of one term and myself who has applied on all three previously mentioned occasions. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, uh, there is one other hand and I'm only going to recognize that and then we're going to move on with our meeting. Janet? We're not, a, I, I just want to be very clear. I'm going to recognize Janet Keller and then that's the end of public comment for tonight. Thank you. Um, I am reading also from uh, part of the email that I sent the council um, earlier today, um, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, as I said then, I am um, asking the council um, in, in the strongest way I know how to uh, not appoint three new members who have no planning board experience um, but instead to reappoint Michael Burt Whistle as a planning um, board member for a three-year term. And I do so in light of the fact that there are three vacancies on the board and the remaining four planning board members have a relatively short tenure. Um, Mr. Burt Whistle has served as a valued member of the planning board, but not only of the planning board, but as liaison from the planning board to the design review board and the Community Preservation Act Committee and has received um, praise from members of both the planning board and uh, um, the Community Preservation Act Committee um, I'm not aware if, uh, of, I assume the same is true of the design review board. Um, he, Mr. Burt Whistle, is the only one of the five candidates with experience serving on any planning board. Um, and I think if the town council wishes to consider some of the, uh, new recommended appointees, um, there, there will be an opportunity to do that um, next year when two more vacancies will open, open up. Um, I would like to um, point out that Mr. Burt Whistle meets more than meets the criteria of the CRC's outreach um, and communication and appointment committee to be part of a strong base of seasoned members, and I stress season. He also um, meets the guidelines that Christine Gray Mullen, who was um, uh, pl outgoing planning board chair, uh, gave to Mandy Johanneke um, in an email listing the skills and characteristics that she thought a successful planning board member should have. Um, I. Um, it's a long list um, and it includes knowing community issues and the master plan, the zoning bylaw and related ordinances and understanding the regulatory function of the board, um, an ability to com communicate clearly and concisely um, and uh, an analytic build ability for decision-making, understanding design and construction drawings, um, and um, 
being available five to 12 hours a week on, uh, on the weeks, um, every two, uh, two times a month um, for uh, when the planning board is in session. Um, Janet, please wrap up. Thank you. So um, I would like to say that um, the, the um, C but the CRC recommended three other candidates with no planning board experience. And um, as you've heard, did not recommend Mr. Greeny. I urge you to um, reappoint Michael Bertwistle at a time when um, the, the uh, experience that he brings is cru crucially needed. Thank you. Thank you for your, we are now going to move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, and we're starting with two items that have been delayed quite for a, quite a lengthy period of time. And I'm sorry, we do, I'm, we now do consent agenda. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Um, so let me just mention that we're showing the consent agenda up here. Uh, the motion, and I will make it as follows. The following items are selected because they are were considered to be routine, and it was reasonable to be expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when the president lists the consent agenda item. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. So the motion is to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as single unit. Referral, HC, referral of capital inventory criteria to finance committee. 11A to D, approval of minutes. I wanna note that one of these minutes has been since corrected with uh, changes that were made by an earlier comment. Uh, July 14, 2020, Joint Town Council and Finance Committee meeting minutes. July 15, 2020, Joint Town Council and Finance Committee meeting minutes. July 28, 2020, Joint Town Council and School Committee Crocker Farm expansion presentation minutes. And August 3, 2020, Town Council meeting minutes. Is there anything that anybody wants removed? Please, I have to get to the screen. Uh, please raise your hand. Seeing nobody, is there a second? Hanneke seconds. Okay. Any further discussion at this time? Then I will do a roll call vote. You can take the screen down, Serge. Thank you. Um, Brewer. Abstain. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Abstain. Reesmer, yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Shane? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Schwartz? Aye. And Baumel? Yes. The vote is 11 yes, no, no, uh, no, no people against it, and two abstentions and nobody absent. Moving on, the next item, now we get to the items that we have delayed for several times. The next item is the Valley CDC project at 132 Northampton Road, the local option. And uh, we need to pull the letter up. And let me just say that if you have other edits to the letter, I've already caught one, thanks to uh, Councillor bringing it to my attention. But the real discussion, and Christine Brestrup is here if we have additional questions. The real discussion is on two items. The one is whether or not all of the items under the paragraph that begins in our recommendation, the local residents, according to local preference, is an applicant that, one, lives in the community, two, is a municipal employee, three, works at a business in the community, and or four, 
has children in the schools of the community. That's one of our discussion items. The second is two paragraphs down and says, furthermore, we recommend that the ZBA local preference not exceed in the decision is at what percent. And we can no, go no higher than 70%. I'd like to have a very brief discussion and then a motion. Are there comments at this time? Kathy? Um, I just want to make sure that I, um, I understand the way this will work. As I understood it, because I did listen to the recent hearing, this local preference would be in the very first round um, of the lottery. Does it then apply as spaces open up, or is it just the first time um, the building and apartments open up? It's, it's a question. Is, is, it is the first round. Is Christine Gray Mullen in the audience? I mean, I'm sorry, is Christine sure. Gray? Yes, she, she, her face is on the screen. Okay, Christine, am I correct that it is only in the first round? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from the council? Um, there's no raise hand here. Um, yeah, down at the bottom, but Pat is next and then I will call on you, Dorothy. Okay, I was having some trouble with uh, going to the maximum 70% local preference. Um, but as I um, investigated some of this, it's clear that a local preference pool and uh, uh, the developer needs to determine the number of local resident minority households there are in the municipality and the percentage of minorities in the local preference pool. And if the percentage of minority local resident households in the local preference pool is less than the percentage of minorities in the surrounding HUD defined area, the developer must adjust the local preference pool to reflect the regional percentage. Mm -hmm. I do not know what the percentage of minority folks are here in Amherst. Um, but I support now the 70% because it would include people from Springfield and Holyoke and other towns that some of the abutters have been rather clear that they didn't want to have in our community. So I am uh, hoping that everyone will support the 70%. Um, Dorothy, you had your hand up or tried to have your hand well, up. Please yes. There is no there is no symbol at the base of my screen for hand up for some reason. But uh, oh, I see it over there. I do. OK, great. I just wanted to comment on the fourth one. Have children in the school system since these are single room occupancy and no couples. It I, that seems a little bit strange to have because they wouldn't be allowed to have if their child overnight, let's say they had a joint custody system set up. So that one seems to be not relevant for this particular apartment unit. Um, um, I'm going to just take a moment and speak to that because I feel strongly this needs to be left in. There may be situations where people have children, they may have visitation rights, they may not be able to have them overnight, but that still allows them to be local and be able to be near their child. So I don't see that as an issue personally. And it's something I feel quite strongly about. George? I'd like just to um, express my support for the 70% and for the, the pref local preference. Um, I think I've spoken about this before, but I'll, so I'll be brief that the town has made a major financial commitment to this project. I think that this is part of my reasoning. And I agree with Pat, this is a regional issue. It's not just a local issue, but I think there are safeguards in place. And um, so I would hope that my colleagues would, would support the local preference. Again, the decision is ultimately by the ZBA. This is simply a recommendation by this body. Uh, it's not binding. Um, so I would encourage you to support it at the full 70%. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the reminder that this is not our decision. This is just a recommendation. Mandy Jo Haneke. Yes, thank you. Um, I've struggled with this one because our financial commitment is only 10% of the total estimated cost of this project, yet we're asking to potentially 
require 70% of the first round residents, uh, first round residents of the building and project to be from Amherst. Um, that seems a bit out of sync to me. Um, yet I did some research and our housing, from our housing trust or our housing thing, we have a whole lot of, and I was reading the SRO, the Valley CDC things, Amherst itself has a whole lot of people on waiting lists for one bedrooms throughout um, the affordable housing units we have in town. So if we didn't give a local preference, it would likely be that a number of people would still qualify from the locality. My biggest concern though is since COVID, um, I had less of a concern about a local preference when we didn't have high unemployment. But now we have huge amounts of unemployment. UMass just laid off 450 low income, low income workers and another furloughed another 800 and some. Those are individuals who likely would have qualified under a local preference to rent and, and apply for this building um, under the works in Amherst section of this local preference item. Yet now, because they are furloughed or they have lost their job, they would not qualify if they don't currently live in Amherst because they no longer have a job in Amherst, even though they did. And um, I'm having real difficulty saying that those individuals who lost their job through no fault of their own because of a global pandemic and a university's decision to um, furlough them and fire them because they don't have students on campus can no longer apply to live in this project under the local preference and get preference for that first round draft. Um, so I don't know what the solution to that is, but I have real concerns saying 70% uh, must be local of uh, the first round must be local when we have such a high unemployment here that will prevent a number of people who would have qualified to be in that first round pool with local preference who will now no longer qualify to be in that first round pool. I'm going to ask counselors not to I mean, just to hold off for a moment. Leave your hand up if you'd like to speak to the four criteria. Uh, I'll call on you later. I'm not, I'm not taking you off the list. I just want to see if we can get a piece of the letter settled. Shalini? Yeah, I'm feeling conflicted about this because on the one hand, we know that this is a regional issue and we want to work with our neighbors around this. And at the same time, I obviously want to give preference to our own people. But then I'm also hearing Mandy Jo say that they work employed here, but now they're not there. So are there any norms or when other similar projects were built in other places, what what is generally the norm when we're working with regional issues like this? Christine, do you have any uh, additional information to add to that question? And I just want to say, Shalini, I'd ask that we stick to the issue of the four items. Yeah, it's the four, it's the 70% one, right? That's fine. Go ahead, Christine. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, most of the time that we have affordable um, units in town, we do, um, we do recommend that the Zoning Board of Appeals require um, that 70% of them be for local preference and um, I am not aware of any time that they have not done that. So in my experience, um, this is very typical that the first round is 70% um, local preference. Are there any comments about the four items, four criteria, not the percentage, not the percentage, Dorothy? I'm not sure if, in fact, the many of those workers who are furloughed are would be included as not working for the town of Amherst. They still, from what I read, they will still be receiving uh, health benefits, and it's uh, they have not been fired. Um, some will be, but a large number are furloughed, which means that they have certain rights to that job to return to it. So I think that they would, in fact, be counted uh, as having as working in Amherst. Could I just add 
to that, Lynn, because I looked it up. A furloughed person is still employed, is in employment law, employer guidelines. There is still an employee relationship. Um, it's very different than being fired. Um, even if you were laid off temporarily, you have it. So that concern, we would under, when you said the specifics, if they have been employed in town and are now furloughed, they would count under what I understand our criteria to be. Okay. Alyssa. You have to unmute. Okay, now all of a sudden there's no hands up. Okay, is there anybody else who would like to speak to the four criteria, not the percentage, the four criteria? Alyssa. Yes, I believe the four criteria which have now disappeared from my screen, thanks to unmuting. Um, are actually accurate for the reasons that were just stated, because again, it's not you, that you have to meet all four of those. And we are still, I believe we still have plenty of municipal employees, plenty of current town residents, and plenty of furloughed people. Again, all of which would have to be looking for a single occupancy place, whereas many, many, many of the furloughed workers and laid off workers have families that couldn't possibly live there anyway. So given those four separate criteria and that they're not additive, that they're separate, I feel very fine with having those be the four criteria. Are there any, now we'll go to the issue of the percentage. Are there additional comments regarding the percentage? Sarah Schwartz. So, yes. Okay, I hope this is okay. And you tell, shut me up if it's not. But oh. I want to say that I, I am not supporting um, the percentage or the, the four criteria. And I will tell you it's because I have a sister that um, is on disability and has had Section 8 for probably 20 years now. And her life would be greatly improved and her health if she were able to move from where she is in Western Massachusetts to Amherst. And she has told me repeatedly for the last 10 years that there is absolutely no way she will ever be able to get affordable housing in Amherst because quote unquote, we are not friendly. There's almost no way to get affordable housing here if you are not from this community. So because I am touched by this personally, I just wanted to, I don't know if anybody else has this experience or has had it. I just wanted to, to bring that up. Your comments, Sarah. Are there additional people who would like to speak to the percentage? Are there people in general, are we ready for a motion? I'm going to try a motion then. Um, the motion is to authorize President Griesmer to sign the letter to the Zoning Board of Appeals regarding the implementation of local preference titled Draft Letter Regarding Local Preference at 132 Northampton Road at as of 7-27-2020. Obviously, we'll change that date recommending that the Zoning Board of Appeals seek approval from the subsidizing agency to implement a local selection preference with the allowable categories of current resident municipal employees, employees of local businesses for the uh, initial lot lottery or has children in the local schools and lease of 70% of the units at 132 Northampton Road. Is there a second? Kathy, you have your hand up. I second. I just want to make sure you're going to fill in the blank that we saw in the page originally. So that's that you put 70%, but I second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Dorothy, you have your hand up. Okay. Uh, seeing no further comments, we'll move to a roll call vote. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Jo Haneke. No. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. No. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. 
Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. No. Sh Shalini Balmilm. No. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Nine, four, four against, and no abstentions. The motion passes. Um, and I will change the letter date accordingly. The next sec the next item at one point was on the consent agenda. We removed it because somebody wanted it removed then, so we bothered not to put it back on. Um, this is an item regarding the master plan update request. And with regard to that, I'm going to first call on uh, Christine Gray Mullen and Christine Bresta. And um, the motion for, are the, um, you will, the motion and that was voted on by the planning board is on the screen in front of you. So uh, Christine Gray Mullen. Uh, yes. Um, hello, I'm actually going to pass the mic over to Christine Bestrup, who has a prepared statement at this time, but I am here if anyone has needs information about the planning board. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I speak? Yes, please. Um, so last winter, the town council requested that the planning board and the planning department undertake an update of the master plan. And the update was to consider the necessary and obvious changes to the master plan, including things like changing reference to the select board and town meeting to town manager and town council. The update was to occur prior to town council adopting the master plan in accordance with Article 9.8 of the Charter. And following the update of the master plan, the planning board and the planning department were to undertake a rewrite of the zoning bylaw in keeping with the goals of the master plan. So we began to work on the master plan update in February and were prepared to present a first chapter to the planning board on March 18th when the governor declared a lockdown due to COVID-19. The March 18th meeting was canceled and the planning board didn't get back to um, the issue of the master plan until May 20th. Um, updating the master plan can be challenging in this time of COVID-19 when we really can't hold public forums and we need to rely on Zoom meetings. Um, once we began working on the master plan update, it became clear that the master plan is a, basically a good document, but it needs implementing. Other than some small changes, the writing that we did was mostly reporting on how the master plan had already been implemented and what was still left to do. Working on the land use chapter, which is chapter three, we did not find many revisions that urgently needed to be made. The master plan contains an implementation matrix, which is several pages long and lists many strategies that are still pertinent and timely and just need to be implemented. Those that are interested in the master plan may wish to focus on the implementation matrix and work on zoning amendments and other actions that still need to be accomplished. When COVID-19 intervened, the town's priorities shifted to the health and safety of its residents, as well as the recovery for the town's economy. And the planning board and the planning department spent a lot of time during the spring and early summer preparing a temporary zoning amendment to allow restaurants, retail, and personal care establishments to operate outdoors. This effort has led to some success, but it really took away time that we might have otherwise spent on the master plan. Since then, the planning board and the planning department have sensed a shift in the focus on the part of many residents and some council members who are eager to see changes to the zoning bylaw. The rewrite of the zoning bylaw seems to be more of a priority right now. The planning board discussed changing its priority to focus on the zoning bylaw at its July 1st meeting. The board voted seven to zero to recommend to town council that town council consider adopting the approved master plan as it is for now and focus the town's attention and resources on the zoning bylaw changes, including establishing, establishing design guidelines and revisit the issue of the master plan at a later date. 
We know that development is coming to our downtown and village centers, and we want to be in a better position to shape that development. And this is only possible with an updated zoning bylaw. With regard to climate change and resiliency issues, we know that ECAC is working on a climate action and resiliency plan, which is due to be completed by the end of the year. When it's complete, a decision can be made about how to incorporate its findings and goals into the master plan, either chapter by chapter or incorporated by reference as a whole plan, similarly to the way that the transportation plan was incorporated. This seems like a good time to pause on the update of the master plan and to shift the town's focus to the rewrite of the zoning bylaw. Thank you, Christine. Uh, is there any additional comment from Christine Gray Mullen on the planning board? I'll, um, I agree with everything that Chris Bestrup just stated, um, and I just want to encourage the town council to really think about prioritization and the best use of our town uh, staff resources, and they are limited, and the planning department is already so full with so much. Uh, we were just really, uh, as a board, we were unanimous. Uh, which is a big deal. All of us were in agreement that we would like to see Chris Bester be able to focus more on um, updating the zoning bylaws. Thank you. Mandy Joe, uh, the Community Resources Committee, uh, comments from your report? Yes, um, I just want to mention that we heard a similar report from uh, the Christine Gray Mellon and Chris Brestrup on July 21st. Um, and took the unanimous planning board uh, recommendation to heart and therefore unanimously with one absent recommends that the council adopt the master plan as is based on that. Um, obviously the motion tonight is not to adopt the master plan as is, it's to stop the update process, but um, that was the vote in CRC was to essentially adopt the master plan as is, which would have the effect of stopping the update process. Um, so we'll move to Councilor Comments. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I am in favor of this. I think it's wise, um, given that the examination said we have a pretty good master plan. There are just large amounts of it that haven't been implemented or different pieces. So I mainly have a question as the shift is on zoning. Um, there is a matrix on implementation, and Chris Bestrup, you came to one earlier CRC meeting, I think it was a year ago, where you started to look through that matrix. Um, I think it may be helpful to at least, you know, yellow highlight uh, priorities of things that haven't been, you know, to somehow say, we've done these things, we've done these, we've done these, you know, tick them off and say, here are some areas that we want to, should be focused on. And I don't know whether all of those linked to zoning or not. So that's, it's, it's a combination of, uh, you know, that, that matrix. And if almost all of them are in some way linked to zoning, then the shift to zoning makes total sense. But I just was thinking of a mix between what, what if, what things haven't been implemented that maybe we could implement without revising our our zoning law in a m major way. So it's it's sort of a question on the undone things on implementation. I'm gonna call on Christine Brestra, but before I do, while you're answering that question, Christine, would you just elaborate on the comment that you made about incorporating climate change and resilience once we have their plan in a manner similar to the way, I believe you said transportation was done? And could you just explain to the council how that happened? Because I think that's one of the outstanding questions for some people. So the way that happened was that the planning board um, took a vote after the transportation plan was finished. And um, the vote was to incorporate the transportation plan by reference into the master plan. And they've done that with other plans. I think they did that with the housing production plan and the market, the housing market study and um, the open space and recreation plan. So over time, they've incorporated many of these um, plans that are sort of peripheral to the master plan into the master plan. 
And we can come up with a list of those if you'd like. Right. The other thing I want to mention, but I also want you to answer Kathy's question or comment. And the time to comment on that may be at the point at which, and it will be sometime either in September or October, decide on the date. But we are required by the charter to have a uh, public forum once a year on the master plan. And so that may be a very good time to do some of this discussion, if you will, and, and questions and comments. I just want to point that out. We originally had thought we'd have it on the uh, 28th of September, but that is the uh, breakfast of uh, Yom Kippur, and that does not work. So, uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Did you want me to answer um, Kathy's question? Yes. Yes, we, um, some, only some of the items in the implementation matrix of the master plan are related to zoning. Those mostly have to do with land use. There are other um, sections of the zoning bylaw, or excuse me, the master plan that have to do with open space and recreation, education, town services, transportation, and various other things. And those have items on the implementation matrix that can also be worked on, but they're not necessarily related to zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Dorothy, you have a question? Um, yes, and again, I want uh, Christine to respond to this. Um, there were changes that had been talked about for over a year that were small changes and they didn't get done. And now this is gonna put them off even further. And that has me very upset. One of them is the um, inclusionary zoning of 10%. Uh, the way the, the uh, zoning law is being interpreted is that this is not triggered in, in, in many, many developments, only if there's, I think it's a change of use request. And so we've had a lot of housing built without a single affordable apartment. Um, the other thing that was mentioned was not a very difficult one, which I think was uh, clarifying a little bit from setback um, not just from the sidewalk but of a certain width, perhaps of uh, 10 or 15 feet. And these are things that were talked about in the um, zoning subcommittee. And um, I mean, I, I was in part of conversations, listening to conversations on these topics for a long time. So if we put it off once again and don't do these very simple things, buildings will be built once again without these qualities, which are considered to be pretty essential. But I may have it wrong. So I want Christine to comment on that. Christine, are these master plan or are they zoning and bylaws? The issues that Dorothy was just mentioning were zoning bylaws. And so those things would be considered to be the priorities while the master plan would be um, kind of put aside for a while. And those don't include um, making change. I mean, they're referenced in the master plan, but they're not the actual action. The action would come when the town council approves a zoning bylaw amendment to the effect of 10% inclusionary zoning or changing a setback. So th uh, those issues are not related to the delay of the master plan. That's right. Okay, good. Thank you. Good clarification. Darcy? Yeah, um, the motion that I see is to we send uh, a vote that we took on February 10th. And at that time, we decided not to vote to adopt the master plan um, because people felt like um, it's we shouldn't adopt it if it hasn't been updated. So um, I, why is it different? Why is the situation different now? why you know my my feeling is the same way that it was on february 10th in that i wouldn't want to adopt a master plan that isn't up to date and doesn't have those um uh climate actions i don't want them just addend an addendum saying the the climate action plan was passed and and this is an addendum to our master plan. The, the climate action plan should be interwoven into all the different parts of the master plan, um, just like those other plans should be also. So anyway, is there someone who can answer that question about 
why would we need to do this now? Um, mm -hmm. Why I have no inclination to adopt a master plan that's way out of date. Christine Gray Mullen, you have your hand up, I believe. Uh, Chris Bastrop can probably better answer this, um, but I, and I wanted to bring up one other point, but <clears throat> this is about town resources and just time. So we, I'm just saying as the planning board, we heard what your vote was the last time and we did our darndest and really looked into it and Chris Bastrop dove deep and the general consensus of the planning board was we have a pretty darn good master plan. It's a framework, it's not a directive, and you have to remember that. And I was a part of the transportation plan that got accepted as an addendum. So it becomes part of the framework. It's not, you know, bullet items, this is what happens. So part of it is the master plan, as Chris Bestrup said, it's not great timing right now with the pandemic going on and the communication the way it is. Um, and that very important environmental climate report will not be done at earliest, you know, the end of this year. So as Chris was saying, let's relook at this next year and, and maybe priorities will shift again. But right now, what really needs to be done, you know, to double on what Dorothy was pointing out, those issues are what are really need to happen and bylaw changes. And they're very complicated, especially inclusionary zoning. There are no easy answers. But Chris Bestrup and her team, and if they need other you know, resources, that's what they're gonna work on, Mr. Morrow. Um, so Chris may have more to add, but I just want to remind everyone when you're looking at that, um, that matrix, one of the key critical parts to it is the MPIC, the Master Plan Implementation Committee that was never formed. We could go back on a long story there and you know many but we are here now, and that maybe is the most important thing that in the next year would be created and moved on for the master plan because they will be critical in collecting data so that we can properly do a, 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 a proper master plan update. And as Chris was saying, not just sort of like a report card of what's been happening and what didn't get happen. We really want to, you know, do it right. So I just want to remind everyone when you do have that meeting, that's really, to me, the first starting point you got to look at the MPIC. Thanks. Christine, did you, Christine Brestrup, did you have any additional comments on that? My only comment is that I understood that your motion tonight was not to adopt the master plan the way it is, but rather to rescind your request to the planning board to um, work on the master plan as a priority at this time. Is that, that, is, correct? That, that is the essence of the motion. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna actually make the motion so it's on the table. So I move to rescind the February 10, 2020 town council vote on- Hold on, we need to suspend rules of procedure 8.4. Oh, sorry. I missed that one on there. I move to suspend Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.4 for the current agenda item. Is there a second? Ryan, second. Okay. Any further discussion on the suspension of the rules, which allows us to act on this motion tonight? This is comments on the suspension of the rules. Mandy Jo, you still have your hand up? Oh, no, I don't. Sorry. Dorothy, is your comment on the suspension of the rules? Darcy, is your comment on the suspension of? No. Okay. Then I'm going to move to a vote on this. Uh, Dumont? No. Reesmer is a yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Abstain. Ross? Yes. Brian? Yes. Shane? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Hort? Yes. Baumilne? Yes. And Brewer? Yes. And DeAngelis? Yes. So the vote is 11 for, one against, and one abstention. So we are going to move on to the main motion. Now, Mandy Jo. Thank you. I move to rescind the February 10, 2020 Town Council vote on agenda item 7I 
that adopted the process for updating and adopting the master plan as set forth in the document titled CRC Proposed Master Plan Process 2020-0204 as recommended by the Community Resources Committee as presented and accept the July, 20, the July 1st, 2020 Planning Board recommendation that the Town Council consider adopting the, mas the approved master plan as is for now and focus the town's attention and resources on the zoning bylaw changes including establishing design guidelines and revisit the issue of the master plan at a later date. Is there a second? Second, uh, Angela. Second. Okay. Discussion. Right. Yes. Did you call on me, Lynn? Yes, I did. Um, yeah, I the language of that motion is uh, I'm not sure what we're being asked to do that that we're being asked to consider adopting or we're not we're not being asked to adopt we're asked to that doesn't make sense to me that we're being it says to accept the July 1st 2020 planning board recommendation that the town council consider adopting, not that we adopt, but consider adopting the approved master plan as is for now and focus the town's attention and resources on the zoning bylaw changes. What does that mean? Okay. That we, if we voted on this motion, we're voting to consider adopting the master plan? All it says is we are voting to consider adopting. It does not mean we are adopting. Lynn, why, why can I explain? Mandy Jo, please. So this motion rescinds our vote that we took on February 10 that adopted a process for updating and adopting a master plan. It had a flow chart and all, it would rescind that vote. And this motion also accepts the planning board recommendation that planning board recommendation was that we move towards adopting the approved master plan as is for now we move towards that goal and we ask the town and we ask that the focus of the town's attention and resources is on zoning bylaw changes that include design guidelines and re and then that we would revisit the issue of the master plan at a later date so it's a motion to rescind the vote that we took that adopted a process to update the master plan and it's to uh, uh, accept the July 1st planning board recommendation. Melissa? I'm sorry, thank you. Um, so I want everybody to write down that I'm gonna say here that Darcy's right. That this, email, that this motion is too convoluted. I understand the words that's, that Mandy Jo is saying. I understand the CRC's idea here. This motion needed to end at the point of saying 2020-0204 uh, as recommended by the, by the Community Resources Committee as presented, period. The, you do not, it is not a sensible legislative decision to accept versus to reject a recommendation that tells you to think about something. That's, that's background, that's useful, that's understanding where we're going next, and I appreciate that. But if you're not going to say we're going to adopt the master plan as is now, which you all remember from February, I'm sure very well, which is what I said we should do. If you're not going to recommend that now, if we're gonna dither around some more and decide in a couple of months, if maybe we're gonna do that, or maybe we're not gonna do that, that doesn't need to be in this motion. Mm -hmm. All that needs to be in this motion is that we're rescinding that previous process because we did send people down a road, right? We asked CRC to go ahead, I didn't, but we did as a council, ask CRC staff planning board to go down a certain road. Now we're telling them, don't go down that road. I believe we have a shared understanding of what's happening next, which is that we're focusing on the bylaw changes that make sense to all of us. That's why Mandy Joe has solicited our comments. That's why the planning board continues to talk about priorities. But I, I totally object to the idea of a motion, including accepting a recommendation that we think about doing something. That just doesn't make any sense to me. So if we cut the last part off, I think we'd be in good shape and we get back to it when we get back to it. Would you like to make a motion to amend? 
I would love to make a motion to amend to remove starting with after this quotation mark on presented. So it's like uh, halfway through and it says and accept the July 120. I would just remove that section from the motion. I think it's important that it be in the minutes. Absolutely. But I don't think it belongs in the motion. Second to the amendment. Kathy? I second it. Your hand, but yes, okay, you've said second it. Is there any further discussion about the amendment to the motion? Could you explain the amendment again? The amendment to the motion means the motion would now read as follows. To rescind the February 10, 2020 town council vote on agenda item 7i that adopted the process for updating and adopting the master plan as set forth in the document titled CRC proposed master plan process 2020-02-04 as recommended by the community resources committee as presented period and has nothing about the planning board about the master plan and their recommendation to adopt it stops at the word presented it, that is the motion that's been made and seconded is there further comment on the motion that's been made and seconded kathy you have your hand up uh yes i i want to say to follow up on Alyssa. i originally put my hand up to say almost what what she said but she said it much better than i did i thought it combined two thoughts and if we just stopped with the first thought um what we're trying to do is the planning board gets off the hook. It doesn't have to spend all this time updating the master plan. It can go on to other business. That's what that first part does. And at some point we'll come back to looking at the master plan, but we're not putting a date certain right in now. And it's much cleaner that way, not to have several actions embedded. So I strongly support the, um, the amendment. Dorothy, do you have your hand up? I just want to make sure that the I, that the convoluted wording, which said, consider adopting the approved master plan, that made me very suspicious of everything. The master plan has not been approved. So what's that mean? That has been eliminated in the amendment. I know, but I want to comment that it was actually there. But, no, no, no. Okay. We're voting on the amendment. The yes. amendment removes that. The fact that the planning board made that recommendation is something we can't change, but we can take it out of this motion. Okay. Is that, is that clear, Dorothy? So that word was put there by the planning board, you're saying? That, that word was put there by the planning board motion, yes. Okay. So the master plan has been approved by the planning board. Thank you. Okay, but not by the town or the public or the town council or the town not meeting. Not by the council, but the planning board's approval is a force of law. Well, then what are we asking? What do we what do we care then? Okay. Just with Second. George, question? Yeah, I I support uh, Alyssa and Kathy and what they're doing. I just have a, a question or concern. I want to make sure I think Alyssa suggested that as long as it's in the minutes, it's adequate but I just wanna make sure that um, the message that we want the planning board to focus its attention and resources on the zoning bylaw is something that it sounds like we all, or most of us share and is being communicated to them. Now, if they read the minutes, it's there. Um, I don't know that we need another motion, but I'm just a little worried about that being lost in this. I agree it needs to be taken out for the reasons that have been stated but I guess my question to Alyssa and to Kathy or to anyone really is what happens to that second message? Is it sufficient that it's in the minutes mm -hmm. um, or do we need to do something a little bit more formal where we actually vote and say, and we would like you to do this? Is that, that's my question. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a motion on the table. It's been made and seconded. There's an amendment to the motion. And now George has asked the question, what is the phrase and focus the town's attention and resources on the zon zoning bylaw changes should remain. Mm. Or if not, how could it, be, does it need or, to be expressed in some kind of formal way or um, 
I think it's an important message that I'd like to send. um, And I don't think it belongs in this motion. I think that Alyssa has made that point very clearly, but is it gonna get lost in the shuffle? I wouldn't, I'd like it not to be lost. Uh, Maybe that's something we'll deal with later. Okay, we can go back and add it and make an additional motion or we can just rest on the fact that it's in the minutes and like the congressional record, it becomes part of what the town council has said. Evan, you've not spoken yet. I, I was just gonna say our, our planning director is in this meeting. She's heard it, she heard it from the planning board. I don't think it needs to be formalized in a vote. I think that the message has been sent. Lisa? You have your hand up. Yeah, I was simply going to say what Evan said, unless they felt like they needed us to write it down, in which case we could just ask Mandy Joe to update them on what we did tonight. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to call the question on the amendment, okay? And that is to rescind the February 10, 2020 Town Council vote on agenda item 7i that adopted the process for updating and adopting the master plan as set forward in a document titled CRC Proposed Master Plan Process 2020-02-04 as recommended by the Community Resources Committee as presented. Uh, Lynn, I just want to be voting to amend that motion. Yeah, the vote, the first vote is to remove the phrase and accept the July 1, 2020 planning board recommendation from the motion so that it would read, if that motion passes, it would read as you just read it. Thank you. So the motion is to remove the second half and Mm -hmm. it it now reads the way I just read it. Yes. Okay. Any questions? All right. Then moving on. Uh, see. Uh, Greasemer is a yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Brian? Yes. Shane? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Paul Milne? Yes. Brewer? Yes. DeAngelis? Yes. Dumont. Yes. It passes 13 to zero, no abstentions and nobody absent. We did the next item and- We have to now vote the actual motion. That just approved the amendment. Okay, so now, the ori- thank you. The original motion is, the motion that has now been amended is to rescind the February 10, 2020 town council vote and I, agenda item 7i that adopted the process for updating and adopting the master plan as set forward in the document titled CRC proposed master plan process 2020-2002-04 as re- recommended by the community resources committee as presented. That is the motion we are now voting on. Evan, do you have a question? Yeah, actually. I, so to be honest, I was surprised when I saw the motion on the motion sheet um, because the vote in CRC, the recommendation from CRC was not that motion. The recommendation from CRC, which was a 401, uh, was that the council adopt the master plan as is. The planning board recommended that we consider adopting the master plan as is. And so I'm still not clear why we're rescinding our our directive to the planning department to update the master plan but not including but saying we're going to put off to later actually adopting the master plan when it the committee that advises on planning has recommended four zero to adopt the planning board which as mandy said has already approved the master plan asked that we consider adopting as is why are why are we putting it off why don't we just do it right now if we're already saying we're going to stop the update we know we're going to be starting up a whole new master plan process probably in the next few years um why i don't understand this this hesitation or this hold on just adopting it as is tonight mandy joe you have your hand up yes so um when i brought the crc recommendation to the president we discussed a process Uh, you'll remember that this was up 
for, it was originally on the agenda back in early August, um, at a time when we were dealing with a whole bunch of other things. Section 9.8 of the charter requires a public hearing be held prior to actual voting on the master plan to um, adopt it. So the thought was, let's get the message across to the town's uh, staff that they should stop working on the master plan while we work towards trying to figure out when to schedule a hearing on the master plan in order to be able to act in accordance with how section 9.8 of the charter requires us to act in order to act on the CRC recommendation that was made. Can I, um, I just want to intervene at this point, okay? The motion that's been made and seconded the amendment means that all we're doing tonight is stopping the process on working on the master plan. In order for us to go forward with a discussion about whether or not we're going to adopt the master plan, I think deserves its own agenda item. I think it, we need to have the hearing, we need to have the public forum. And I think if we spend any more time tonight debating those issues, we're wasting everyone's time. Anybody like to speak? Fine. Let's move forward. The next item on the agenda. We still have to vote it. Oh, we do? Okay. Thank you. We haven't actually voted the motion yet. All right. So we're voting the motion. I'm going to start with uh, Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Driver. Aye. Steinberg. Yes. Wart. Yes. Almel. Yes. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. Yes. Dumont. Yes. And there's a yes. So the motion passes. 13 0 with no absence or abstention. Okay. Now we can move on, right? Okay. We are now going back to items 7A and 7B. I promise you a break at the end of these two. And just want to make sure Dorothy heard me on that one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Paul, you're going to give us a brief presentation or a statement or just an update on the community safety discussions. Yeah, so um, I want to, you have received the, um, for the goals discussion, a statement from the Racial Equity Task Force. Um, I want to give you an update on where we were on this conversation. So I have had a pretty extensive conversation with Tisha Baz from that group, um, but also had a, um, a extensive conversation with members from the um, DFON 413 folks on Thursday night, uh, where they were primarily interested in learning more about the budget process and how to involve themselves in the budget process earlier in the system in the, uh, in the year. Um, so that was a very good session with them. Um, as we move forward, we uh, will be reaching out to multi other members of the BIPOC community in attempt to um, develop a better presentation for you at the next meeting. So that's that's for the that that presentation. Are there any questions of the town manager at this time on this? Uh, clearly it will be coming back at a future meeting. Pat DeAngelis. Unmute Pat. Sorry. Um, I am interested in finding out where we are with the establishment of a committee um, to overlook um, uh, the policing. We froze two positions in the mm -hmm. budget so that we would move forward. And mm -hmm. there's that group is supposed to report at least a preliminary report by January 31st. And I feel like it's in limbo and that's making me very uncomfortable. I, I hear you on that, Pat, uh, um, and know that the clock is ticking and we have to get something to you. And that, that's our highest level, highest urgency level, but wanna make sure that we 
are involving a broad set of members of the community in that in that so it's not just me appointing groups of people you know um, so I, I totally feel that ticking in my heart as well uh, could I add um, thank you uh, that is, that is very good um, I am uh, I lost my point um, I'll have to come back and I'll, and I'll email it to you, Paul. I apologize. Okay. Being 74 going on 75 is hard. <laughs> that, no, age is no excuse. Okay. COVID-19 update. Paul? So if we can put the slides up, um, search. Thank you. So I will be... Um, presenting this tonight. This is a update. You'll see some of the familiar size by slides, but there's new information I want to make sure that you see. So the next slide. Um, first, a quick status report. Next slide. So this is as of uh, this morning. Uh, the, the town has 16 current cases. So in the past, we've been reporting on all the total cases so far, uh, since we've been counting, there's been 137 cases in Amherst, and there are currently 16 active cases that are being monitored. The other information is, is all on the state's website, um, which you can link to from that, from that link. So next slide. Again, we are in a good good place. We are, you know, the, the indicators, we are, um, if you can go to the next slide, you'll see the color actually. Um, we are green, which is the, the, the status is there's, there's four statuses, gray, green, yellow, red. We are green. Um, and, but what is likely to happen is you, we expect to see a change in status at some point um, because the, the status report, the indicators that the state uses is retro, it looks back on a two week time frame, And we have been doing uh, extensive testing in the town so as we move forward, you will see that um, you may see our status change and we'll keep you updated as that happens. Next slide. So I want to talk about how we're monitoring or how the public can monitor our three institutional partners. So each of them has set up a um, dashboard of sorts. UMass has a very sophisticated dashboard um, and they have identified nine positive cases. It's, it's just lists their uh, total tests completed and the nine positive cases. Um, Amherst has, um, as, of, as of this morning, had tested 8,683 people with three positives. Uh, Amher uh, Hampshire College, as of last week, uh, when they last, their last report was 821 tests uh, with zero positive. So I wanna show you, if you go to the next slide, what their websites look like. So this is the UMass uh, dashboard. And it doesn't just tell you the cumulative tests and the positive cases that it also is looking at a, a much more sophisticated level of the cumulative positivity rate, which is very important because they are testing all um, people, you know, asymptomatic and symptomatic. And so that they are really monitoring everybody. So the cumulative positivity rate is likely, is, the, is sort of the key metric there. Um, and then they'd look at it over time because it's another key metric. And it, there's a lot more information on their website. The next slide, please. Uh, Amherst College is very similar. They are listing as much information as they can. They're, they're breaking it down by student, faculty, and staff. Uh, by, by week, they're reflecting what they are finding out uh, by week. Um, and again, this is something that they are updating pretty much every day. I think it's it maybe six days a week that they're actually updating it. Uh, Hampshire doesn't have anything as nearly as sophisticated on it, on this, but they are reporting their numbers on their website, which is, I have that link on there for you. So next slide. So um, uh, before we leave that, just I want to mention that the state, when it, they, the state does the color thing with the um, gray, green, yellow, red, it's a kind of a blunt tool that they're using. They're just looking at positive rates, the increase in positive um, cases over the past two weeks. So we, you know, we anticipate that we might go up on that and we might will go down on it. So there'll be some sort of up going up and down. What's important is that is to monitor what happens in the next few weeks because right now there is a, there are enormous you saw the number of tests that are being done uh, by the university and the colleges and which is creating a new benchmark basically what what is the 
sta state of everybody who's come into town. Um, on continuity of operations, everything is in really good shape. The one thing that's different on this is that we, uh, our health director, Julie Fetterman, has retired as of tomorrow. And we have, I have appointed Jennifer Brown as the acting health director. Jennifer Brown has been our public health nurse and working very closely with Julie for, for many years. She's very excited about taking on this role. Um, she is not a candidate to be the permanent health director. Um, but she has been working very closely with Julie and with our institutional partners. And she's the one responsible for all the contact tracing in the town. So she's very up to speed on it. To support her um, for the administrative things that come up, uh, Dave Zomack will be taking on responsibilities to for anything that is um, the more bureaucratic uh, administrative things where Jen Brown needs support on. And I've also con I'm also contracting with a neighboring um, health director uh, for a few hours for a, a, a few hours a week or as many hours as we actually need um, to support uh, Jen on the bigger picture things. This is a person who will be um, on all the same calls that Jen is on at the state level. But when there's, um, you know, the, the state comes out with very detailed directives of say, you know, what, how should lacrosse be implemented or, you know, some details on some other things. Uh, this is a person who's going to be learning it and internalizing it for their own community. Um, and once, and then can help inform us and is willing to meet with us on a regular basis as well. Um, so that additional level of support um, for Jen Brown will give us, I think that everyone's feels, feeling really comfortable that we have the technical expertise. We have Jen who's really rock solid uh, in her own right. And then we have the sort of administrative support as well. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of outreach, um, we continue um, all the normal things we are, um, there is the community forum that the president referenced earlier today. That is this Thursday at 5:30. Um, you can participate. Anybody can participate via Zoom, uh, or you can just watch it through live stream. And I put the live stream link here on the website. Um, we are um, reviewing our call-in events. We've been doing that every on Thursdays. We're th rethinking about how that could be better. Um, we are doing um, continue with the cup of Joe. And the other thing that we are looking at during September is to physically go out into the community um, and be at locations that uh, make us more accessible to people with proper social distancing, with, with you know, not having pe that many people around. Um, so we're looking at places that people are not as usually involved, like uh, on food, one of the food pickup days at, at um, survival center um, or, the um, you know mobile market at, at South Point in different locations at Fort River. So we, I want to get out into the more into the neighbors into the community uh, after Labor Day. So you'll there um, the CPOs are setting up those kinds of uh, opportunities to be able to interact with people and hear what the concerns are, especially with what's the economic uh, situation that's happening. So next slide. So updates on this. Next slide. So we have our call-in number. Um, this is our new call-in number, 413-259-2425. It's monitored seven days a week. It's answered during business hours. Um, but we are, you know, if you leave a voicemail or if you write an email to that, um, to that email address, which is a little bit funky looking there, um, you'll get a response. Uh, we have our staff coming in on Saturdays and Sundays to listen to voicemail messages or to uh, respond in real time. Um, you know, we've, this has been up for almost a week now. Um, we announced it on Wednesday um, and we've gotten about 14 or 15 calls. Um, and then the um, people who handle those calls can re can sort of deal, deal them, responds to everybody and then um, sort of, fields them and gives them to the appropriate staff. If it's um, a police matter, if it's a um, inspection services matter or wherever it goes. And some of it comes to me. So they are monitoring these things and making sure they're getting into the right hand so people get a response. What we have found is that many people are, are pleased to have this number. They don't feel like they want to take up the time of the police department with a call, but they do feel they need to register their concerns. Some people also appreciate the ability to communicate with us on the voicemail so that they don't have to give their names. 
because uh, they are they might be talking about a neighbor or um, you know someone who lives in the same building as they do, and so they're they feel com more comfortable um, calling just sort of so somewhat anonymously, and we can follow up with them on those on those calls and that email. Um, so next slide. We also are have ambassadors coming, and this is this. These are the t this 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 picture and the one on the previous slide are the T-shirts that our ambassadors will be wearing. Um, so they, uh, I think we have ten who have been hired to date. Uh, we're processing them all through our um, HR process. It takes a little bit of time. Um, we do have a supervisor of all of the ambassadors. Uh, they will be out on the streets and they will be working in teams. Um, they. Um, the, the lead person also works, she, she works part-time for us and works part-time for the university and has very close contacts with the university um, off student housing um, office. Um, again, our, our main directive to the, the ambassadors is to educate, offer masks in the in downtown area and other areas of town where we are getting, uh, wherever we get comments from the public um, again, we will use the calls and the emails that come into our COVID hotline as sort of information for where our, these folks can go. Um, and then if they, and the idea is to not be confrontational, to walk away if there is confrontation, they will be trained in de-escalation de techniques. Um, but really it's, it's not to get into situations. Uh, and in the beginning, we will have staff available to them. And, you know, while they're on the streets, we'll have st uh, additional professional town staff available to them to help them go through these the situations that they're going through. And we're going to learn a lot after the, the next, you know, week. And we'll, we're going you know, to be monitoring this on a daily basis. Um, Bill Laramie from the police department is in um, Casey Nagel, our community community officer are the two that are most directly uh, working with with this group um, so so in terms of where we're headed um, so you know these are things that we looked at before I'll talk more later um, right, about the elections it's really not re COVID related it is but it isn't um, but the things I want to really focus on is the next slide and this is the last slide for you um, what I've been messaging to our town staff and to others is that um, I anticipate that we will be in the sa this same situation a year from now, and we should be planning along along those those lines. I don't see anything happening this fall, and I don't see even if there is a um, vaccine, it will take a long time to roll out. So, all of our planning, all of our messaging to staff, and in terms of how we're operating is that we are looking at this at least for the next year. So we should be making those decisions and making those kinds of accommodations for the public now so that we are doing the best job that we can. Um, I expect our status, you know, I mentioned earlier, our status to change as we are doing additional testing for asymptomatic, asymptomatic individuals through um, the colleges and the university. Um, and then we'll just be continuing to, to manage, adjust, review, implement, just as we have all along. So I know you probably have lots of questions, so I don't want to be too long-winded on this. Thanks, Serge, for taking the slide down. Uh, questions from the council? Shalini, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Paul. I really love the Ambassadors program and I think it's such a great initiative. I do feel, you know, this is in response to a lot we've been hearing from people and it's a first step. So that's amazing. Love the t-shirts. The questions um, are um, along what we've been hearing is, are we um, making an effort to appoint um, BIPOC folks as ambassadors? What is, uh, and then in terms of the training itself, um, you know, like what, what so other than de-escalation training, we need empathy training or just an understanding of the racial issues and equity issues. So it's that included in the training. Um, and then the call-in number as well, similar questions about uh, are there bilingual people answering the calls and what sort of training is being 
provided because I think there is a lot of stress right now and people calling in are probably angry and whatnot. And I understand that the staff is overstretched. So also just reminding the staff, please, please be kind. And, and of course, this is to the public as well. Please be kind to the staff because everyone is so exhausted and overwhelmed. Um, last thing is about the testing. Um, do people know if there is and where is the free testing options available? Three things. Okay, so I'll go back reverse. So I don't know <laughs> if people know where the free testing is. And, you know, in fact, I don't know if that's on our website or not. There is a um, test center in Holyoke. Um, we continue to advocate to have one in Hampshire County. Um, but I can, that's actually probably information people would really in be interested to know. And we should put that on our website. Um, in terms of the phone calls, um, at the beginning of this, we have, uh, I've, I've um, assigned our community participation officers to be the ones fielding the calls. They're used to handling every call you can imagine coming into the town manager's office. Um, and they're very experienced and they're, and you know, it's mainly Jennifer and Angela and they, we have um, language ability for Spanish and English, uh, not and we could get, we can get any other language, but those are the two that are readily available when we have the call or if it, if, to return calls. Um, so we have sp Spanish and English um, availability. Um, and also, you know, what we've said is we're gonna t monitor this for a couple of weeks, see what kinds of calls, see what the volume is, um, see, see what the uh, types of topics that people are coming in with, um, you know, you know, again, Angela and Jennifer handle everything that you could possibly imagine comes in through the door. Um, so totally confident in their ability to manage through this. Um, and they know how to, you know, have a good conversation with someone so that people know that they've been heard and, um, and they follow up too, if they need to. Um, in terms of the training, so these are um, part-time people who will be on the streets uh, in a pretty much sort of, um, excuse me, you don't have a mask on, here's a mask, would you like it type thing. There's not, we have see, don't see a lot of, um, uh, they will get a basic de-escalation um, training from two state certified de-escalation experts. Um, but, um, but there won't be a lot of, um, I don't anticipate, um, we're, we're hoping that they're not gonna find themselves in confrontational situations. And if they, if they do, we, we, the answer is walk away it's nothing is worth it. It's just walk away. You know, that's the most, the best de-escalation technique. Uh, in terms of outreach, um, you know, I don't know exactly what we've done. We've been trying to run as fast as we can to get people in those t-shirts basically. Um, if we've, I'm not sure if we've made a special um, outreach effort, but we're open. We'd love to have as many people um, that represent the town and represent the broader community as possible. Um, the initiative on this really was driven towards um, what we anticipated to be students coming back to town and and that's where most of the calls have come from so far is is being having a sort of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with students versus having a police officer interact and that's that's why we're moving in this direction that's why we really focused on teaming up with the university in terms of working together in terms of the staffing of this i hope that answers all your questions i'm actually going to add one item on the outreach uh, because uh, Bill Laramie and um, the rent rented inspector John Thompson, mm -hmm. uh, even Captain Ting was at a meeting just today that was in a neighborhood outreach on this, uh, along with UMass people. They have also been walking the streets with UMass people in neighborhoods around UMass. So there is a concerted effort on behalf of the joint effort, if you will, mm. are uh, of town employees and the university employees reaching out into the neighborhoods where there's a lot of students uh, present. Can I just clarify one point about the testing center at Holyoke? Is it true that the Cooley Dickinson is providing free transportation to people? They, I think they have the ability to do that as well, yes. But I can so look that would that. be great for people to know who don't have transportation yep. and if they have COVID that Cooley Dickinson is providing the transportation. Got it. Good point. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, yes, so uh, three questions related to COVID. Um, the first one is, what is our funding for COVID looking like? I know we had COVID specific funds from the federal government and all. Where does that stand in terms of how much has been spent? Do we think we're going to have enough um, in terms of to cover all of our expenses related to COVID? Uh, daytime shelter in cold weather. We're coming up on cold weather. Uh, what is being thought of and will COVID funds cover that? And then the third one is your comment on if we're in this for a year. Uh, town buildings still aren't open. The library is still not open for browsing of books. Um, but shopping is open. Gyms are open. We're in phase three. When are buildings going to open in town to for those short-term type of interactions to add internet uh, connectivity to people, computer access to people? We've shown over the course of the last number of months that those types of buildings being open have not raised our positivity rate and can be done safely. So when is that going to happen here? Good. Um, so the funding, there's ample funding that we have. Uh, um, and we were had allocated some funds actually for um, uh, a food program that the school was running, that they, but that has now been extended by federal government to December 31. So that's really good news. That's money we don't have to allocate for that program. But um, we have ample funds to do the things that we need to do. So I don't know the exact number, but we're, we're not concerned about that. Um, the, oh, the shelter. So these are some things I would, I'm happy to talk about now as opposed to waiting to the town manager's report. Yes, there's a number of things in the shelter that are that I reported on in the town manager report that um, one is the what's going to happen with the shelter. It's We're eight weeks away from when that should be opening. Uh, Craig Stores uh, is looking at different op options. They are still in conversations with the church um, and looking at some other options that they, they have um, available. So we're hoping that, that that will move forward in a, in a very positive way with better sheltering for our um, unhoused individuals. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, the daytime shelter, clearly that's something that we're going we are um, actively having conversations about where is an appropriate location for us to do that. To do that. Um, we did do the pop-up tent cooling center, which, you know, I was down there a few times and talked to some of the, the guests and they really appreciated it in an odd way because they felt they could walk in and walk out, not to have to be tested if they were walking in or walking out. If they wanted to smoke a cigarette, they could just step outside the tent and they, they, they were, they felt it was very comfortable. It was much cooler than outside. So that was um, nice to hear that, that they, they were, they were pleased with that. Um, and they didn't like the idea of being inside. But when the cold weather comes, it changes. And we don't have the places that people normally are able to stay to get warm. And we know we have to find something along those lines. Um, you know, we're looking at town buildings. We're looking at other locations. Um, the same issues that we have for anybody, um, we would um, have to make sure that there was proper social spacing, that there's adequate um, ventilation, and that the... Um, HVAC system is up to grade to be able to process the air. So um, once we get past our um, um, elections, our facilities folks are going to re reposition on, on this. This will be a high priority for us. Um, you know, the library is looking to put up a tent in front of the library uh, to provide uh, internet access to people. Um, and so I think that they're still moving in that direction. Um, and they have a pretty pretty robust plan to provide access. But again, and I'm not sure if they're thinking about heating for that as well. Um, in terms of opening, I think East Hampton just announced that all of their buildings are gonna be closed through the end of the calendar year. Our My, my focus, um, and I won't speak for the library, is my focus is on maintaining the health of our um, staff. And um, if, you know, if someone comes into the building that is turns out to be COVID, then we have to empty out the building. So we're really diligent about um, having people being able to work here and do their jobs. Um, we, I recognize that if we are thinking about this long-term, we have to start getting um, uh, ways for the people to interact with our staff in a face-to-face in -face manner, which is certainly possible. And we're looking at a couple of different ways to do that so everybody can maintain safety. Um, and still have access to the services that they need. Um, 
so working on that in terms of whether we actually open the building to let people walk around the building, we're really, I'm really hesitant to do that. And it's really, we found that it's really not necessary to have the public um, available to walk in, the, in through the building. Um, well, I don't think that we will be having in-person meetings for a, for a quite a long time. It's the worst situation if you are saying, um, we know that the way the virus spreads is by people being in this, being together in the same space for more than 15 minutes of dwell time. Um, and that's what meetings are defined as. And so we don't wanna go down that route of holding uh, public meetings. And quite frankly, we find that the Zoom meetings are some ways more um, available. And, and once you open up and you have unlimited capacity at a Zoom meeting, whereas if you, we had, you know, I think the town room allows 18 people to be in the room. So we would be telling a lot of people that they can't come into the, to the room when they wanted to. So, um, and the senior center for sure won't, will not open in the near future. And I think that's pretty much, that's pretty common um, throughout the state. Um, Alyssa, you have your hand up. Thank you for your patience while I find my little mouse. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the focus on staff safety. I really do. I. I know this is going to sound a little awkward, but Town Hall and the Jones Library are not supposed to be open in order to provide day shelter for populations that are currently homeless. That's not what the job of the library or Town Hall is. And so one of the things I did ask the town manager about in all his spare time is to report to us on progress for providing day services for people. Because that's something we've been wanting to do since the day we started a warming shelter. Before it even became an overnight shelter, we just kind of expected more agencies to come forward and say, oh, you do the nighttime thing, we'll do the daytime thing. And it just hasn't really happened now. Everyone's under this immense amount of pressure. And so I'm hoping there might be some opportunities there. As he mentioned, Craig Stores is looking at various things they can do because they'll have to de-densify the existing shelter because that's just the reality. You can't have as many people there. We had gone up to 28 beds and now we can't do that. So I, I appreciate the focus on safety and the way to do things differently, just like many of us are having doctor's appointments, you know, via video now, maybe using more and more of that technology. I realize that doesn't take care of people who aren't housed. So that's why I want to make sure we're continuing to find ways to partner with agencies that we can find a way to address that. Um, Skipping all the way back to the new hotline on the phone, I just want to make sure that we are in fact, and I did hear the town manager indicate that there were going to be themes that were thought about, you know, what are people calling about, what are the kinds of things, but I want to make sure that we're tracking that in some fashion, because what, what I don't want to have happen is two months from now to hear a nice little report of a text, you know, a little text paragraph that says, everybody pulled together and did a great job answering 2,500 phone calls. Like, I want to know these were the kinds of calls people had. This is who we sent them to. This group was responsive. This group wasn't responsive. And I, because I think, again, this is a long-term situation. And so I want to know that we're not just like taking that pink message slip. Oh, I sent it along to somebody else. Crumple, throw away. Um, we are actually keeping track of those themes. I know that takes more effort. I know everybody has more work than everything else. But I think it's important to focus on some themes that include things like interaction with local businesses, because we know originally some businesses were having trouble with people who didn't want to wear masks and they didn't, you know, nobody wants to escalate a situation like that. Um, people who do currently identify as homeless and anything we can do to help in any way. And also, for example, groups of people who are not respecting the rules at Puffer's Pond. We're hearing some mixed messaging about that, like it's fine and other people are freaking out because it's nowhere like it was associated with the hula hoops where people were keeping their nice distancing. And so I think just eventually starting to hear some feedback as to what kinds of calls people made, whether it's to the hotline, to the email, or some people are just going to call the police anyway, or they're going to call their favorite staff member anyway and report it to them. If that could be, you know, just kind of an ongoing tally. Here's where the focus is. When we talked to UMass, they took care of it, as Lynn was reporting, associated with the neighborhood walkarounds. But I think it's important that we're actually gathering data associated with that because we we deserve that. We're, we made the effort. We're putting staff resources behind this, and we should go ahead and reinforce that by showing that we're keeping track of what we're doing and then be able to figure out what we can do better as this does continue to drag on for a long time. So thank you. 
So if I can respond to that. So yes, we are doing that. We have a Google sheet that the, all the people are, have access to. And, um, and then that gets shared out. Uh, it, it, we, 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 I don't, <laughs> our talented staff, you know, they pick the pieces and say, this is yours. Let's, you know, and so they document when it came in and we're, we're on track when the calls come in too. you know, you know, do they stop coming in a certain hour? Because it might mean that we want to start staffing live the, the calls at different hours of the day. So this, these first couple of weeks are going to be sort of a trial for us to see what's the volume coming in. Um, so thank you for that. Dorothy, you have your hand up. I have two points. Uh, one, I really do think we should get town testing um, and ideally of, of uh, one for the virus and one for the um, antibodies. But and that would be, you know, a major setup. And I think that the reason that would be good is that the most of the people in the town of Amherst have not been tested, do not know how to get tested. But it would also be training for setting up for the vaccination when it should come which will be everybody's going to want it all at once and perhaps even some help with the flu shots since they have been required for all children and uh, seniors are waiting for the super senior flu shot. So that's a suggestion that not only is it something we want, but it mm -hmm. would be helping you prepare for the final, the big setup. But the other point is one I brought up a number of times and I'm getting increasingly concerned with it. Um, as you know, I teach at Holyoke Community College and I've been spending most of the summer um, banging my head against the wall, learning how to do Moodle and Zoom and to do best practices in online education. And it is very complicated. And I'm starting to be able to get my pages designed. I'm now thinking about my students. How will they know how to log on? Where will they get their help? And then I'm thinking of our public school students. Um, and I am a grandmother of two children, a sixth grader and a seventh grader, who have had to suffer through sudden online teaching and I know all the problems with it. And the biggest problem that I can see in Amherst is lack of wireless in huge sections of the town. So my thought is if we have COVID money, um, we should be using it to help people, students, children, and their parents who have to help them with this, be able to take advantage of what I hope will be improved online education in the schools. Um, we can't just and have rely on a, a few parking lots where people go and get some wireless. And even that should be organized because those who can should do that. I, I just see this cutting off of people. And in addition, I don't want volunteer money to buy hotspots for students. I want Wi-Fi for students. And I don't want volunteer money to be to provide um, uh, little uh, iPads and wireless for seniors, a senior without access to steady, reliable Wi-Fi and c computer, some kind of computer um, machine is an absolutely isolated senior. Many people have, do not leave their homes, barely go outside. And this has gone on, we're, we're six months into it. And I'm a pretty strict person myself. So I, I just think Wi-Fi available to all people in this town, those who don't have access now, is one of our most fundamental things that we can do at this time in, in COVID, particularly since I agree with you, we're in it for the long haul. We're in it for at least another year. So on the testing, um, so the town has, we have a couple, we were advocating for testing um, early in the spring and we have a plan laid out to be able to do mobile testing at um, a couple different locations. So if that were to come to fruition, we're, we know exactly what it would take and what the capacity is and the number of people that we would need. It's already been done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, depending on when they do it, it depends on what, what spaces, i.e. parking lots are available to us, but mm -hmm. we know, we know what the, what the requirements are for such a thing. Um, what the, what the atypical, um, you know, we worked with uh, Cooley Dickinson hospital on this previous, you know, many months ago. So, we're, we're, if, if we are, that's why we continue to advocate so aggressively to have a, a testing site in the town right. of Amherst. Uh, we, th I think it's really important. Um, we do have, um, you know, the interesting thing is that we have a lot of students who are being tested and coming out negative. And so they feel they've got their green check of uh, courage. Yeah. Um, so uh, that will be something that we will also be noting as well. 
Uh, in terms of uh, Wi-Fi access, I think the the school department early on did a really really good job of ensuring that no student was not did not have access and um, and was able to learn remotely. I think that was a very very high priority for the district, and they put a lot of money into making sure that that happened. I don't know if it's you know the downside of hotspots or if the, if they were if they were I know they were using utilizing hotspots. They looked at a couple different techniques for how to do that. I think hotspots was the tool that they used because it was easily uh, implemented and given to everybody individually. Um, so I think they really went through you know, student by student said, how are you accessing education mm -hmm. through us? So at the student level, that's the case. Now the point with the, your point about seniors is a really good point because that's you know something that uh, a lot of seniors don't have access to and it, it is super isolating. It's been a real concern of the director of senior services. Um, you know, so I, um, I'll have to think about a little bit about how we, um, if we start paying for things, um, how we would do something like that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, George, you have your hand up. Well, just a quick question about that, the raw numbers. When you mm -hmm. say uh, 16 current cases in Amherst. That, that doesn't include the nine at the college or at the university and three at Amherst College, right? Those are separate oh, it boards. Does. It does. So oh, yeah. it, that's a total, 16 total. And so 12 of those are at the campuses and the rest are in the town at large. That's It's an aggregate you, number. You, you can't exactly do that though, um, because the university may have nine cases, but three of them may live in Sunderland, right? So you, I knew people, we knew this when they, when they started putting up their dashboards, we talked with the university and the college and they said, well, one of them lives in Amherst, but two, but they want to show their community. And so they're doing their, 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 their dashboards are for their purposes. Um, the university and the town are very closely um, linked and they, everybody sees the same database. So they know what they're looking at. It's the Maven system. Um, the, and so the, if you are diagnosed and you live in another community, it will go to that community. Um, but for the university, our 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 public health nurse uh, Jen Brown can see that information as well, and what what kind of contact tracing is being done and who's picked it up. As soon as the call, as soon as a, a positive case comes in, they're in communication. They say who's who's got this one, who's working it, and they are really tight on that communication. Let me let me correct my thing. What I do know is that if a person is tested at the university and they give a local Amherst address, their number is part of Amherst. It's not a separate number. I think that's many people feel like somehow or another the student number is on top of whatever is going on in Amherst, but it's not. And just to, the university does try to get them to give a local address too. I mean, you may live in Reading or, you know, Salem, but they're really trying to say, what's your local address? Where are you locally? Um, because a lot of people just give their home address as a matter of course. So they're really trying to track where are you? Um, so. All right. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I thought Sarah was before me, but Lynn, you're, you're seeing the order. Um, yeah. But, Okay, um, I, I just had a, a question on the, the university side, Paul, and it's partly so people who are listening, we've had people contacting us saying, you know, how tough will the university be in helping us enforce certain kinds of things if their code of conduct of the agreement students have signed um, doesn't happen. And I, I, I just, can you quickly say that? And I... You know, I know you've agreed to do a district one meeting, but that's a question that I've had from some people up here and for some groups. And they've noticed our ambassador people love the way the contact and I know some of what the university is doing, but just um, they've said, are we going, are they going to do what Syracuse does? Are they going to do what, you know, in terms of how tough will they be? So we've certainly, even as of today, talked to them about how you know, Holy Cross, Northeastern, BU, Syracuse, a number of you know, Vanderbilt, different places have a, have a, have addressed it. Um, they um, see this as a very much an internal decision-making process through so their uh, Dean of Student Affairs. Um, we think that 
you know, we're working very hard to walk arm in arm with them so that we're, we're complementing each other um, with an E, not an I um, in compliment. And, um, and, but we're, um, we're not always on the same page, quite frankly. And I think you'll, you might hear a little bit about this Thursday night as well, because I think that'll be a, a question that will come in on that, on that call. Um, you know, I think they, they feel very strongly because they have a long history with dealing with um, the events in was it 2013, 14 um, and how they responded and how, what worked and what didn't work. And they feel like they have a, a lot of institutional knowledge about leading with education and uh, interacting in a really positive way to create this uh, culture of compliance. Um, and, um, you know, they do a lot, they put a lot of effort into meeting with individuals. So when, it, when something happens over the weekend, the, the people are out there in their, at their houses. And one of the good things that I, I noted um, was that with COVID, almost everybody's home. So you go and literally knock on their door, um, someone answers the door. And they said, we had, you know, and this happened through our COVID hotline. You know, someone said, I live in a building with someone who's, who's, I don't think is a, is, you know, a group, a party, and we'll go out and say, talk with them. We'll have someone go to their door. So um, we're hoping that that is the, we're not hoping, we're, we know that that does work. Um, but in terms of the additional steps the university can take, the academic things, um, that's a thing that they hold very tightly, honestly. Um, I'm going to intervene and just say, we have consistently and persistently asked the university to do off-campus testing as a requirement. And thus far, it has not been, except for when a student arrives, and it has not been continual after that. And in addition to that, they have not been willing to use the issue of enrollment as any kind of stick if, it, if they don't obey. And in many cases, this is the difference between public and private institutions. And so it's a very tough line to walk. And I compliment Paul and his patience and his, um, his uh, dipl diplomacy. Um, and sometimes I have to be the, I get to be nasty. <laughs> so um, it's really uh, not acceptable that they are not testing all their students all the time. And just, but just a side note on that, they did send, they did, they are asking all off-campus students to come in for a second test. Uh, something went out today to all their off-campus students saying, time to come to get your second test, because they are doing the first arrival second test, which is a really good thing. Um, and one other thing um, that our, the, the health folks are noticing is that sometimes the tests are surfacing people who had COVID up to three months ago. And so the tests are still coming back positive. So, you know, just as our as Julie Fetterman will always say, a test is not a test, it's not a test. There, there's significant differences in the type of tests and how they're managed. Um, results are not the same. You know, a result is not a result, it's not a result because it, you, you may show, show positive for COVID, but that was because you had it two months ago. And so, but you're not, you may still have it as it might show as a positive on the test. So. I'm getting above my head on the technology, uh, techni technicalities of it, but there are, uh, it's, it, there's some, you know, epidemiologists and public health people can talk much more adroitly about this. Sarah, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I just wanted to, I had, um, had a text conversation with Paul about this, um, uh, I think about a week ago. I have had constituents, um, the, I think the for, during the heat wave when the students first came back, I had 10 people that I have not met personally contact me um, about concerns. And um, what I'm wondering if we could uh, have on the website somewhere that's easily found and also distributed to town counselors in some sort of way that we could post it on our Facebook pages. We could send it out to people if they needed it and they could print it themselves. Um, some of the things that I would say are the what if questions. So a lot of people are very confused. Um, so what if they see a really large party where people are not social distancing and um, they don't have masks on, like a very large gathering. Mm -hmm. um, and so what if? So, I mean, I think we, I think people need to see if it's on, you know, 
private property, call whoever, and here's the number. Um, if uh, you're if you have groups at, at public places like Puffer's Pond or at a park, um, if there's a very large group and they're not wearing masks and there's not social distancing, what do people do? Um, do they call the uh, Department of Public Health? What's that number? People are concerned that they don't know who the director is anymore. I think all that information you gave to us is fantastic. And I think that the coordinated efforts and who's, who is um, heading up the Board of Health should be something that people can find easily. Um, what if there's a lot of people in, in my district that are nervous when students moved in, they've got a smallish house and they're seeing consistently 10 to 12 cars there. And so then there's this, this thing where people are like, well, you know, should we call uh, the town and make sure that they're not, you know, people that aren't related? I, I think that the, the more information that we can give people about um, who to contact, what we're doing, um, if there's enforcement or not, um, is really helpful to people because if you don't know something or you don't know how to contact someone, you feel really scared and panicked. And when you feel really scared and panicked, you're not, it makes you feel unreasonable because you're scared. Um, so those are things that I'm wondering, I think that everybody should have, counselors should have access to, should be clear on the website. And that when we send things out to our constituents, we can say, hey, so here, here it is, here's who to contact in case of what. And if you're good with your you know, phone, put it on, take a screenshot, put it on your reminders. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then print it or have someone print it and print a couple so that if your friend says, I don't have any idea what to do, and you can, I don't know, if we're close enough to hand those to people, or we could leave them in your mailbox. We can't do that because that's against the law. We could leave it under a rock uh, in your front yard. Those, those things I think are, are really helpful as far <laughs> as, far as helping people in the community feel really heard and um, and calming them, them down. Um, and I want to point out that I'm not just talking about students. I've had students say, I've seen a bunch of, okay, we're going to say old people because I qualify, I'm 50, old people that are just, they're reckless. They've had a huge party. There's all these old people next door to me and they're not social distancing. So it just, I think it gives people a way to feel heard. And then if we respond to them, hey, we looked into it. Um, I yeah. Think it's yeah, so really good points. Uh, and so the answer to all of them is yes, 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 yes. And the answer is COVID concerns at AmherstMA.gov or 259 uh, Those are the numbers. We don't want calling the health director or the board of health isn't going to get anything done. Um, the health director um, isn't going to have time to respond to all those things but when if it comes to our number if it is something that involves the health director she she will get it um and a lot of times it's usually it's almost always not the health director it's inspection services or it's conservation or it's lsse or somebody else um that and we want these things coming in because we're able to track it we can start to you know like Alyssa said we're tracking them and we're we're going to group them and say hey here's what's happening these are the times of day they're coming in uh, we do have um someone hired who's going to be going to parks from 12 to 8 uh, during the day to just sort of, again, be an ambassador, um, talk about social distancing in, in our parks at, you know, Mill River and at Kiwanis Park, all the different parks, um, you know, Groff Park, things like that. So people are, are aware that there's someone there who can help and be a resource because a lot of people don't want to take the time to complain but if they see someone with an official looking shirt on they'll say you know i've got a problem over here and they'll mention it and they'll feel better about it um I, we want people to call we don't want people to intervene uh, i think that's a recipe for disaster and um you know it's not a, and it's in fact in the board of health uh, regulation that the people are told not to try to confront people i've had many people tell me that they've stopped people on the street and told them to wear a mask and it's just you shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, um, you know, again, all, all those things are really, people are anxious and they're nervous. Um, and there are some times when people can social distance and not wear a mask. And that's something that Julie has mentioned a lot is that you can be on a beach or going in for a swim and not have to have a mask on. You can, you know, be outside walking down a road without a mask on, as long as you've got one on with you so you can put it on. Uh, when you get near someone. Um, 
because outdoors it's much easier. It's the it, when you get inside that it really becomes an issue. So again, the the number and we can we'll we should actually it's it's a good point. We should get that out to you guys because you you have much broader connections and you can we should get something that's really easy for people to post and share social media. That, that that's a really good thing. And grab it right off the top of the agenda tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from the council? Okay, we're going to take a five minute break. And when we come back, I'm going to um, describe some changes in our approach to the agenda tonight. Okay. With regard to the agenda, um, I've checked with a few people. Uh, we are going to delay the amendment to bylaw 3.28, the single use plastic bag prohibition to the 14th of September. Thank you, Darcy, and to GOL. Um, and while we will have a brief conversation about the performance goals, we are not going to try to complete them tonight and pass them, but to rather have a conversation about them. Okay? Any other suggestions or questions? Evan? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that we're pushing off the uh, amendment to the plastic Bit, uh, plastic bag ban bylaw. Oof, that alliteration is going to kill me. Um, I, I'd like to um, make a request along with that. I found it very frustrating trying to navigate that. There were several documents in the packet. It was really difficult for me to understand which is the version we're actually voting yes. on. There was a clean version. There were several track change versions that were not the same as the clean version. There was also no memo. Um, describing what the changes were and why they were being made. Um, with respect to my good friend, George Ryan, I found the GOL's report on that to be incredibly unhelpful in, in understanding what the recommendation is and why. Um, it also looked to me like perhaps there were fairly substantive changes being made and maybe I'm wrong, but it looked like perhaps the deferment was getting nixed. Um, and if so, that seemed to be more substantive than just GOL. And so my, my request is when it gets back on the 14th, if we could have um, an amped up version of GOL's report and an actual memo from the sponsor. Thank you, I agree with all of that. Any other comments at this time? Any other suggestions? All right, then uh, the next item on our agenda is the town manager's performance evaluation memo. And um, several people have sent me some individual comments. So what I am going to ask Serge is that I, um, instead of you doing this, that I actually bring up my version, okay? So I don't want to get into, um, I only am doing this so that we can look at the substantial uh, suggestions. Um, the first one is the following, further working with the, cap with the Joint Capital Planning Committee, you revise the capital spending budget for FY21 to I think it should be just with a creative approach. To the significant, to the to significantly diminish. Resources available, something like that, uh, and give gave priority on maintaining operating budgets that support services. It's a comment that would be under fiscal and uh, it is an addition right there. 
Let me just go back and just point out a few things that I changed, okay? In each of these, Steve and others felt that it would be good to be able, this is the wrong version. Okay. You, you made a grammatical, you made something that was grammatically incorrect, correct. You made it incorrect when you took off the ED off of diminished. Thank you. Okay. I added in the number of counselors. Thank you. There, thank you. I added in the number of counselors to the memo. I also have suggested that I will attach all of the individual uh, responses directly to the memo, as well as the town manager's self-evaluation. They are not attached here. Uh, and then I went through and did a variety of changes that you saw in the updated version. One of the changes that I want to discuss is several counselors noted that the town will need to reassess what is affordable given the change econ changed economic reality, which likely will mean a less optimistic view of what will be possible over the next years several years given town and resident budget constraints. Andy, would you please speak to this one since this is a comment you made? Yeah, let me, uh, so there were a couple of reasons that I raised questions about it. One was the question that um, I think had come up in discussion at the last time we talked about the evaluation memo the term several counselors and at what point does something that is said by one or two counselors become a policy or, or a finding that is reportable mm -hmm. and uh, I tried to go back and look as best I could and I certainly wasn't finding that there was anything that would give me a feeling that there was a consensus on this and the other concern that I had was that it is um, partly about the evaluation, but it's mostly about what needs to come ahead. And it belongs in goals for the next year, not evaluations of the year that was just behind us. Um, it was not about activity related to the year behind us. So the recommendation is that based on that, that this be deleted. Yes since right now I am doing this as a tracking, I'm, I'm temporarily delete that, okay? Um, then we go down to the next one, which is also a comment here, Andy, that you made. Um, I think that it was just a matter of trying to reword this so that it would be um, a positive statement about what was happening um, as opposed um, in, in the, the way in what the town manager did. So when I was, uh, what I came up with was after uh, recognizing the uh, public concern um, about what's been happening nationally, there was a public demand for a local response. The council appreciates your work with us to craft a resolution that enabled us to approve the proposed budget. I think that if we're evaluating the town manager, that was the uh, action that uh, we would be evaluating. And that's what I was proposing to include. Okay. Let me go on to a couple other this is one that Alyssa worked on adding mostly further explaining kinds of phrases. Um, and then also additional to the golf course. Lynn, we aren't having time to read these as you're paging through and we haven't seen right. them before. Right. All right, so we'll start from the beginning, okay? Now, I'm not, this is starting from the clean copy that I sent in your packet, okay? 
It's not, do you want me to go all the way back to the original one? Mindy Jo? No, I'm just talking about the ones you've been pointing out have not been on the screen long enough for us to actually read. Okay. Let me just ask from a show of hands. I'm trying to get to my thing. I can't see how I can see hands. Athena, are there any hands up? Yes, Darcy has a hand up. Darcy. Yeah, I just wanted to make the comment that when we talked about this at our last meeting, um, there was some considerable concern about including a sentence that said one counselor said this or that. Mm -hmm. So now Andy is objecting to a sentence that says several counselors said this or that. Um, so what what is our policy going to be on this cover letter? Are we are we going to let one counselor um, make a complaint about a sentence and it will be removed about comments that were made by several counselors? I think um, what we, I, I'm just going to I'm going to say what I believe Andy said, and that is he went back to the reading of the comments and there weren't several counselors. That's correct. Really more of, a, of an individual counselor comment or two. So you you had you had compiled them in to remove those. I let me try let me do this. I, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um I'm going to go back to Serge. Why don't you put up the original document where I made all the changes? Okay, so this is the document in which I made all of the changes and it's in your packet and it's something I sent to you, I believe by Thursday of last week. Okay. Are Can there any? Larger, yes. Enlarge it. Oh, thank you. Yes, please enlarge it. So one of the major changes I did was add in the actual count of counselors. And in many instances, I had to clarify that count because the way the survey was set up, it didn't have a forced choice and therefore some counselors actually would hit two responses. And in other instances, a counselor would not respond. And so, but I stuck with the same general guidelines of the 30% are four counselors throughout, okay? And then I explained the issue of needing more evidence, which is something Darcy, you had brought up uh, and just said that counselors require evidence and or more information about an, an issue. And this is probably a communication issue. Okay, moving on. I should be able to pull up my thing now to make sure if there's questions. Yes, I can. Okay, Serge, can you scroll down? Okay, and then I, uh, that's too far. Way too far. Yeah, and then I added and scroll down. And then I said that I would add these documents as attachments when we do the final one. Okay. And so here's an example of you had 67% or eight counselors, 33 or four are four counselors, zero needs improvement, zero unsatisfactory, 
zero unable to judge, but note one counselor did not respond. And so that explains why you have different percentages and stuff like that. Okay. Now we go on to the text. And this is right here is something that somebody suggested a couple different people suggested that we be very clear that the whole issue of policing was a national issue that also affected us. People also asked that we be very clear that the agreements be with the other colleges and name them and not necessarily refer to one other institution we might check with. Um, this is actually the statement that Andy, right here, the several counselors, this is the one that Andy is taking issue with. And I believe that Andy has now read this much more carefully and gone back over the comments. And so that's the one that I was going to suggest we take out again. Several counselors noted that the town will need to reassess. And Andy's point was that he did not see evidence of several counselors but the other point he made is that this is really a suggestion for next year's goals, not this year's goals. Okay. Um, any questions here? Yes, Andy. Yes, yeah, so I think that uh, it really breaks into two questions, two parts. And one is the, the point that um, Darcy made a moment ago and if there are several counselors who believe that they said in their evaluation that the town needs to reassess what is affordable given the changed economic reality um, or something that had that meaning, um, then I stand corrected, apologize, and would uh, um, treat that separately. And I think that it should be included. And if you could almost ask people to raise their hands and if a few people, say, uh, raise their hand saying that um, they think they said something close to that or that had that intent, that's fine. This, the part after the hyphen is a little bit different because which likely will mean a less optimistic view of what will be possible over the next um, several years and um, going through the, the end of that sentence. That is, uh, um, a speculative um, question, and I don't think that it was something that was discussed at all other than um, the suggestion to add by one counselor, and I respect that counselor's opinion, but I don't think that that makes it a um, policy statement that we ought to adopt into an evaluation. So I would bra um, suggest breaking the question into two parts as I've just described. So the first part is whether or not counselors agree with the following statement. Andy has suggested you raise your hand. Mandy Joe, is that legal? I mean, it depends on whether you're just taking a sense of the council or whether there's a motion to remove. It's a sense of the council. Okay. This, I'd like to know from the council whether there is a sense that several counselors voted, noted, I'm sorry, noted that the town will need to reassess what is affordable given the changing, changed economic reality. Please raise your hand. Happy raised your hand. Oh, I do have three. I see three. All right, so maybe we want to modify it by just say a few counselors, okay? But Lynn, is, are, we, are you asking, do you believe that or does that belong here? I thought Andy pointed out this belongs in next year's goals. No, um, he's saying the second half belongs in next year's goals. Where do you start then? Several counselors uh, noted? Several counselors noted that the town will need to reassess what yeah. is given the change. I, but that's for next year. 
isn't it? No, I, at that point in the sentence, if you stop and put a period about given the change economic reality period, the rest of it is looking at next year and that should be taken out. Andy's right about that. Right. So the question is, do people agree leaving in something that says a few counselors noted that the town will need to reassess what is affordable given the change economic reality period and take the rest out. This is the town manager's goals or no, his evaluation. evaluation. We're talking about what he did. This is in the future tense. Well, you're right. So I'm confused. Yep, you're right. So you're right. It's really all in the future tense. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I agree with the statement, but I don't think it belongs here. All right. Several counselors would have noted that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we just take it out. Yeah. It's in next year's goals anyway. Okay. Yeah. Hands down, please. And then I just want to say, as a person who contributed to that sentence, I'm fine with removing it. Okay. Thank you. Then we go on to the next one where we have a lot of red, which is down below. And this is the statement about national attention on the murder of black men and women and children by police in other states, et cetera. Several of you gave me different um, ways of stating this. I chose one. Is there any further comment on that? Pat or Kathy, I don't think you want your hands up at this point. Pat, you want your hand up? Okay. All right. Then we go on and uh, we're all the way into the next goal, which is the climate action. And there was a suggestion under climate action. Please scroll on down. after listing all of the various things, all of these mm -hmm. represent your efforts to implement projects or initiatives that the town council identified as actionable in the short term, including building regional alliances and securing grants. All that does is, is tie this back up to the goal. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Um, the rest is and this, and then there was the statement on the system to track energy savings and it should continue as a goal for the coming year. Problem with that? All right, then we'll move on to the next one, which is long-term planning. And Alyssa, this is the one where you gave me various comments I had showed earlier. We didn't pause on it, but all of them basically made the second paragraph that despite the pandemic, yes. gave it more clarity. It's not shown here, however. I didn't, none of it was changing anything substantial though. Mandy Joe. Yeah, yeah I, I guess my question is, is there an intention to change whatever Alyssa provided? And if so, I think we need to have a chance to actually read it. Okay. We can We're going to be expected to vote on this document today. Okay. We can come back to that then. Okay. But let's, I don't want to switch back and forth with documents. Okay. So then uh, the other change on the next paragraph again was just clarifying. I just added the words golf course property because who's gonna remember five years from now what Hickory Ridge is? Okay. So yeah. So Hickory Ridge golf course was added in there. Um, then going on to other substantial changes. The next ones really come 
in the area under expanded community engagement, which is Roman numeral five. You keep going. Okay. And you start to see some of them right here. Those were mostly minor. Uh, but on the next page is where you start to see, this is where we got into the issue of one counselor. And I did try to eliminate uh, a lot of that. I'm looking for comments on how this was edited. Alyssa. So I just want to clarify, because this is so hard for you to keep switching documents around. You, like you said, you already gave us what we're seeing on the screen right now. So if we had an objection to what we're screening on the screen right now, we should have told you already because you gave us that opportunity. So the more difficult part is because we later gave comments after we saw this version, after we saw the clean version, what Andy wrote, what I wrote, what other people wrote isn't on here. And so I appreciate that you're not switching back and forth documents, but I'm not sure why we need to go through this document that you already gave us that we all had the opportunity to respond to. I'm just making sure that we're clear and we're fine on what I did do already. And then I'll go to the next round, okay? All right, then moving on, the next one is in the area of economic development. And there was that paragraph. And then uh, there was a lot of additional paragraphs at the end, uh, it, a lot in the paragraph at the end that really started into one counselor, et cetera. Okay. So those are the major changes before of what, those are the major changes of what went into your packet. Okay. Are there any questions on those changes before we take this version down? Okay. So Serge, I'm going to have to have you take this version down. And then we're going to go to this version. Okay, this is the cleaned up version. This one was in your packet. And since then, I have received some additional comments. First one we've already discussed, which was taking this comment out entirely. Dana, you're gonna to have to tell me if people have their hands raised. Alyssa and Maddie have hands up. Um, didn't we agree to take it out? Yes, we did. That's, oh. I just wanna make sure no more discussion on that. Oh, okay. Okay. Then Andy had also made this hey, suggestion. My hands up. Um, I'm sorry, Mandy Jones. The previous page has changes on it that I'd like to actually see. That, those oh. changes. Okay. <laughs> This change was suggested by Kathy. In the red writing. Right. I said fine to take it out. Yeah. No, I, I, I just hadn't had a chance to read it. So I wanted to be able to read it. Um, the word committee is spelled wrong. So that should be corrected. But um, OK. because. Yeah making changes as she was reading it and then we never had a chance to actually read it. 
I'm sorry, yes. This is Capital Committee, yeah. No, I wrote it fast. I'm, I'm good with it now that I've had a chance to actually read it. Okay, are there any other comments? Please, Athena, let me know if there are. Not at this point. Okay. Then we go to the one that we already agreed on here. And now we're down to this one. And I'll just give you time to read it. It was Andy wanting to say something in a slightly more positive way. It sounds good. Any other comments? Athena? Not at this point. Okay. Then the, the next one, this is the paragraph, I'll give you quite a bit of time to read it, that Alyssa edited. No hands. Any further comments? Okay. This is the place where Alyssa put the golf course property. Pretty straightforward. And Here is where we said, uh, in the area of economic development, marks were considerably mixed with mixed ratings in the subcategories. Maybe that's awkward. Well, you would need an E. That fixes it. Okay. Any questions on that? Kathy, you added this. Yeah, I, I, I mainly flagged this because when you go back to the very beginning of the memo um, on positive ratings, it didn't note, and then later on this mixed rating, I was just struck by in one place said it's mixed and I realized the mix is in these subcategories. That's what you were referring to. You know, it's the overall rating is positive, but then you go into each category and there's a lot of variation. So I thought this sentence was an accurate sentence. It's just, did you want to, when you, I mean, Paul is listening to all of this. So, you know, did you, you want to just send a signal on the very first part where we said, great ratings in this whole category to say, ex although there was a mix in the subcategories. So it was just trying to be consistent when, in the body of the memo with the summary. I can see the precise, okay? So then there is little indication of any activity or progress. That was a sentence that wasn't complete. It's complete because it completes the non the beginning of the parenthetical. But in most of the subcategories, there's little indication of any activity or progress. So you're saying leave this in. Yeah. And then at the very end, Alyssa provided an explanation 
as to why we don't have any of these and that past practice combined this feedback with comments from the public. Okay, it's just an explanation. So let me just explain that in, would, does anybody want to go back to another part of the memo? I'm going to stop sharing. And let me just say that what happened in the past was I took this, I did one more run through for grammar or anything else, and I put the final one in your packet, but we voted this tonight. So the motion is to adopt the town the FY20 town manager performance evaluation as amended. Is there a second? Anarchy seconds. Any further discussion? Okay, then we start with Pam. Dorothy, you have to unmute. Dorothy, you have to unmute. Lower right. I lost the screen for a moment. Okay, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Steve. Yes. Dine, uh, Andy. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Melanie. Yes. Alyssa. Yes. Pat. Yes. Dorsey. Yes. Reesmers. Yes. Haneke. Yes. And I'm last. So I'm going to take the time to say thank you, Paul, for pivoting so well and dealing with COVID so well. Yes. It's a good year. So I think what we haven't done is do exactly what Mandy Joe has said. And uh, we can spend a little time saying some thanks to Paul and why don't we all do that? Because this has been an amazing year and um, having to judge you on goals that we wrote before COVID, many of us would have liked to have thrown those goals out and started over. And so it made it a very difficult thing, but you've done an amazing job, so. Other comments people would like to make at this time. I just I I just want to echo that, but also, Paul, whatever level of stress you're feeling, you always look like ah. <laughs> Drugs. <laughs> Things are going smoothly, and and I really appreciate how much credit you give to the staff that's that's sitting there, um, working, to do a plan and then undo the whole plan and come up with a new plan um, as in the budget thing. And they too didn't come in, you know, like they had just been thrown against the wall and were dead. They came in ready to have a conversation about it. So it's really a tribute to your leadership, but also the people you have working with you. So thank you. Are there other comments? Sarah. So one of the things that we were asked to comment on was um, if we're trying to get a hold of Paul, <laughs> what is our success rate? And I just want to say that um, every time I reached out to Paul, um, he's always gotten back to me right away and has been very compassionate and has followed up on the things that I have asked him about, including sometimes um, having to text him on weekends about things during COVID. And I really appreciate that very, 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 very much. And he never makes me feel like I'm a pain, which is fabulous. So thank you. Dorothy. Well, there, there are times when I wonder why Paul really wants this job and even going through this whole process of us judging him and writing a report card um, and uh, how he's put up with these difficult times. But then every now and then I get a glimpse of what does turn him on 
And that is, he gets very excited when things are very bad. <laughs> um, I, I read a belatedly um, something you sent about the storm we had a couple of weeks ago. And it was just filled with life, uh, talking about the police were, where the t power line was down and they're guarding this and the, re the uh, dispatchers are doing a great job. And I had this idea of you kind of running around the whole town, checking everybody out. And I said, well, that's a happy man today. So um, I guess you're the right man for the right time because we've got a lot of disasters right now. So thank you. We have an opportunity because we're going to go into executive session to continue that. And but Paul, did you want to say something now or later? Yeah, I, I just want to thank you. I know you you put an enormous amount of work into this uh, evaluation process, and I I really appreciate how seriously you take it. You're absolutely right that it's a team effort, and this reflects on the t entire team. Um, and um, you know, I, I I I always appreciate the good graces everyone brings. Um, to the to the endeavor that we're involved in, um, and it's really working with people that makes the job worthwhile. So, um, and even when it's when we're in, in disagreement, you know, it's okay to be expressing those things. So, um, I do just you know I appreciate the um, level of detail you've given because I'm always looking for good information. And if there's anything that didn't fit into these boxes of the performance thing that you said, just send me an email. I really do look for that kind of feedback so I can serve the town better basically so I appreciate it and this meeting is awfully long so I'm there all right so we're going to have a brief discussion about the goals uh and I think at this point what we want to do is call on um George because this comes out of CRC and the other CRC members who may want to speak to them. Uh, and so, uh, Serge, would you put the latest draft of the goals? And enlarge them. Thank you. Okay, hey, George. You're muted, George. Ah, uh, George, you were muted. That's a great explanation, but we didn't hear any of it. <laughs> now you're muted again. No? How's that? That's good. Sorry. Um, this is the sixth version and, um, I'm proud of it. I think we've, we've done a really good job trying to craft six very explicit policy goals that I hope give Paul a very clear sense of what we think he should be focusing on, um, for this coming year, climate action, community health and safety, economic vitality, the four capital projects, housing, racial equity and social justice. And with each, within each one, we've tried to pick out specific items that uh, we would like him in particular to focus on. And we tried to, in most cases, connect it to a specific council action that we've taken as a body. And then the second half of the document has not changed as much really, um, but they are management goals. And again, focusing on administration, leadership, and personnel, and then finance, long-term vision, community engagement, and relationship with the town council. Um, so I think this is a, a very fine document that um, will give Paul a clear sense of what we, what our priorities are um, for the coming year. And so I think it's probably most valuable to hear what the rest of you think. And so that's what I have to say. Okay. Comments, please. Kathy. And I, you said earlier, um, when you 
introduced all of this that we weren't going to have a longer discussion, a short discussion on this tonight on the goals. Mm -hmm. um, one of the comments I made that I sent today, you know, yes. um, in a track change is does reflect the comment we just took out of the evaluation of the past year that um, on the particularly on when we're talking about the four building projects, I think we need to put yes, we did vote a year ago um, with a let's move forward, but we're in a very different time period now and I think we're going to need to reassess. Um, and so I, I provided some language on that so that we can be talking about, you know, what we have, what we think we're going to have in a, um, and, and the, the staff, it's, it's one of the things the staff is going to have to give us be, best thinking, and we're heading toward that already on the amount of money we're going to have available um, as we think about the coming year, FY22, and the next three years so that we go back and look at timelines with the modeling. And I, I gave some language on that, but the way it's worded right now sounds like all, all engines are still on um, full throttle forward um, because we said, go, go, forward with, with, go forward with God last year, you know, like we, we can do this. And I think we're in a different situation. So I wanted to tone that down or put it into it. In, in part so that Paul as manager, um, he doesn't have to be completely positive if we have very difficult decisions, tough decisions on trade-offs. So that kind of, um, you know, what can we afford? What can the residents afford? You know, so we're also talking about taxes. So I wanted to just be careful on that wording. Um, and I provided some suggested wording, but that is just the trying to, change the tone a little bit to since everyone is talking about that people don't have money necessarily even to pay their current taxes but they don't know where um, a paycheck is going to come from and we belt tightened this year on capital and we might have to next year too and if we keep doing that it becomes every let every more difficult to maintain buildings maintain roads so it's the tone of that section. so i've forwarded your comments to george as chair of gol and this is on the agenda for GOL on Wednesday, right, George? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Darcy. Uh, I would endorse uh, Kathy's suggestion that she just made. And also, um, in, in light of the uh, proposal proposals that the Racial Equity Task Force has made, um, I, I would support the proposal to um, not only have the separate equity, racial equity goal, but to weave um, racial equity into um, the specifics. And um, I'd like this level of specific goals and objectives to be included um, for climate action too. Um, we. Uh, last year looked at whether or not we should have a separate goal or weave it into the different goals and we decided for climate action to make just the one goal and we didn't really mention it much in the other goals. So it obviously if we have a if we have a major commitment that we're making to racial equity and to climate action, it does make sense to mention it throughout the document in the different goal areas. And right now, the, the new goals are not really, the format is really not set up to include that degree of specificity. Um, and this is why I actually really like the way it was written for this fiscal year, including much more, many more of the lower level objectives and more specificity. So um, I really feel like um, we need to um, have a separate main goal and evidence throughout the document um, that each of these, both racial equity and climate action and our other big priorities are being dealt with in hiring and policy making and with, within all the departments across the board on every level, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's 
what I would suggest, more specificity and more, more objectives included. George. I just want to remind my colleagues that this is a document that reflects the views supposedly of 13 people. And so I think there has to be a certain amount of, what do you want to call it? Breathing space, sort of room, um, because not all of us are going to agree about this specificity. And we can spend the next many meetings discussing very specific action items. I think this document tries to articulate six very important goals that I do think we share and tries to give Paul some clear sense of priority along these six items and some idea of where we'd like to see him go. But I think if we get into a certain level of specificity, the whole thing falls apart. Um, at least I think it would. So I think we have to do, at least from my perspective, a balancing act between coming up with goals we can all agree on and a level of specificity that doesn't go beyond what in fact the 13 of us can tolerate. Okay, Pat, you have your hand up. Uh, when GOL worked on the, when GOL worked on this, um, we felt like the policies filtered down throughout the management goals, um, and we were trying to keep it as open as possible. Um, but I really feel right now that I would like to see the specificity that the Racial Equity Task Force is offering um, filtered through the document. Um, and, but I think that we have to have discussions about which aspects of that document are we accepting and which ones we are, might not. Uh, it does make me uh, concerned, and I said immediately to when I was talking to someone today, well, if we do this, we do it for environmental issues too. Um, and I think while I like the clean document, I think that this is a time where we have to let go of the frame that we made and open it more uh, to what the community seems to want. And if we do it for racial equity, we do it for community health and safety, then I believe we have to open it up um, for the environmental issues as well. I, let me just say, we're not going to resolve this tonight. No. These are all suggestions to go back to GOL. Okay. Alyssa. So I, I want to say this really carefully. I don't think any of our committees is up to doing that task right now. So I agree with doing the things we're talking about doing that Pat's talking about doing that Darcy's talking about doing. I agree completely about interweaving things about both climate action and community safety and policing and social justice throughout this. I just don't see how we're going to accomplish that at this point through the committee process because GL is going to meet again this week and they're going to take another crack at it and then we're going to say it's not good enough again. So I'm trying to get to a point where I'm wondering if we can figure out a way to approve a basic set of these broader goals and commit to revising it at the next meeting or two meetings from now. Because if we just keep reopening the whole thing before we ever have a set of goals, I appreciate that you know we wanna get it done, we wanna get it over with, but I also like the goals as a living document. And so as we hear more things, we already have one document that we haven't had a chance to incorporate. And as Pat said, I don't wanna, mischaracterize what she said, but we don't necessarily, all 13 of us, as reflecting what George said, going to agree with every single thing the Racial Equity Task Force asked for. And so how do we get GOL to somehow magically know what the 13 of us think about that before our next meeting? I'm, and so I'm really struggling with how do we approach this? And that's why I keep coming back to this idea of trying to do a base set of these more broad generic goals and then say and we commit to we are all going to feed information to so and so and on the side they're going to work on x for the next meeting and see if that one gets us closer to where we want to go because we're coming at this from capital we're coming at this from community safety we're coming at this from climate and i think we could spend 
an eight hour retreat on this. And I just don't know that we can do it through the committee process and still be satisfied next time and not have GOL just banging their head on the desk saying, okay, now what do you want? Mandy Joe. I second what George and Alyssa said. Um, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned, there are, I believe it's six policy goals listed that we as a council have deemed equally important. Um, and so if we start weaving one or two of them into all of the management goals, I would argue we need to weave all six into the management goals. Housing and affordable housing, economic vitality. One of the things we are saying is vitally important in this town for this next year, if we want to be able to deal with affordable housing and you know the four major capital projects and frankly racial equity and climate action we need some businesses in town to be able to have tax dollars to be able to do some of the things that are being asked of us um i think we also have to remember that the manager is the chief executive officer we are not executive we are legislative so we my belief is that we should not be micromanaging how he does his job. And the more we put more specificity, we put into goals, whether they be management or policy, the more micromanaged he becomes. And that's, I think, somewhere where we're also struggling with as a 13 member committee to determine what the appropriate level of that is. And we have widely different views on that level. Um, so that's why I second what George said. Um, I don't think we should go along a path where we don't pass a single document until January. That's not fair to our manager. Um, the sooner, I think we, we're already two months into the fiscal year and he doesn't have goals yet. Um, we can't keep pushing this on so that we're three, four or five months in without goals. I think we need to consider adopting a more general policy and then doing potentially what Alyssa did. But again, every time we, every meeting we spend on goals, we either add to the length of our meetings or we do less legislative work and we are the legislature. Andy. So it's actually good to follow up on Mandy's comment, but she said some of what I was going to say, which helps me a lot. Um, when we talked about it at GOL, one of the things we were recognizing is that we do hire a professional with um, expectation of a large number of skills in order to know how to do things. And that what our goal, our role rather, should be in establishing goals is to set the priorities but not to micromanage uh, what, how they are accomplished. And that was the um, sort of the philosophy with which GOL was approaching this drafting. And uh, in conversations with Paul participating, uh, what he was really looking for most strongly um, uh, if I misstated, he can speak for himself, but I don't think he's going to need to. It was that he wanted to know what are the key policies that the council was looking for him to accomplish and to address during the next year. And the, the uh, first set of uh, goals was um, intended to address that question uh, and the last comment i'll make because it's getting late is on the racial equity task force as an example i think that we can at gol uh, work on a way to incorporate a reference to the document uh, but we don't have to incorporate every piece of it to accomplish the result Melanie. Please unmute. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm sorry I didn't send my comments earlier. I was waiting for comments from some other BIPOC residents that I sent out the documents to. And what I heard back from um, some of the people, um, BIPOC people, was that that um, 
I think, I mean, they kind of supported my idea, which came independently from them, was that having a, com a committee formed that's going to do this work of reaching out to different community groups and then based on the information we receive, that needs to lead us in the direction of what actions we're going to take with policing rather than going in with the idea of we're going to cut defund. Maybe that will be the recommendation, but we want to lead from, um, from that, that to be an output and not an input. So that was one feedback I got. Um, there does seem to be like, if we are in agreement that this is an important goal, that we hire a diversity officer and who can really help us do this in the right way. And that's something we need to figure out when and how we can afford that. But I mean, I think it's important to have that discussion about whether it's part-time or if we can't afford full-time, but that's a discussion. Um, along with that is maybe uh, if, it, if you do want to, I think it's an important goal to weave in because and just even if you're asking the questions. So for example, how we might be able to weave in the question of equity, let's say in economic vitality, I was thinking uh, just the way we have a sentence which says to ensure the present and future economic health and well-being of the town, working closely with local institutions and business entities, including the bed and chamber of commerce. Maybe here is where we could add, um, like just like he would be, uh, Paul would be working with the bed and chamber. Once there is this future committee, that would also be part of the discussion in terms of how we can support people of color who might be trying to start businesses or youth empowerment or so forth. So I feel there is a way to uh, weave in and be specific enough, but not dictating to the extent that we already have specificity right now, there is a way to weave in some of these because I think these are very important questions. And if you don't ask them, we may not go towards finding um, solutions for that. And um, my other comment was around uh, management and personnel management, where we have certain goals for diversity, but making them more, could we have more specific? And I think that's something I learned from Paul was smart goals around, like, could we have measurable goals? And if you don't have them right now, maybe just even outline having the goal of outlining a process for finding what is our baseline and what are some goals we have. And my last point is about the economic development director. Again, I know it's- We're in we a time. To, me, to George. Yeah. Shalini, will you be sending those to George? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'll definitely send those. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy? Well, I think one of the, I, I do I do see both sides of the argument and I do see the reason to use the simplified goals that are more general in the categories now that I, I do agree that at some point, we're not ready now, we should be weaving the racial justice and the uh, climate goals into each goal. Uh, but one reason we cannot do that now is although we've had, particularly at the beginning of the council, which seems like a long time ago, many discussions on the climate goals, we reached some agreement. We have not had a discussion on the uh, racial equity task force and we haven't, to, where we have to determine um, what we think is desirable and what we think is possible, um, perhaps at this time or some future time. And as a discussion that I do think we need to have, I certainly don't want to outsource that. I mean, these are our goals that we are creating for our town manager. Um, so that's the discussion that we haven't had. Um, so I guess that although I do agree these two strands should be woven into each goal, um, I can agree with passing the, them as they are now because it's important to have the goals near the beginning of the year. 
but understand that we have a discussion that we have not had um, where we're going to talk about what we think is possible and desirable uh, from the racial equity task force. Evan. Yeah, so I just wanted to speak to, to two things. Uh, I appreciated um, that GOL did uh, two things with these goals. One is I appreciate that they tied each one to council action, but the other thing is that they did keep them broad. Um, when we were doing this uh, eight or nine months ago with the FY20 goals, um, I argued for much more specifics. And today I want to do the exact opposite. And I appreciate the broadness and I don't want specifics. And I think the reason for that comes from my experience doing the town manager evaluation uh, mm -hmm. earlier this month. And what I found was um, I, I gave the town manager very high marks under economic development because I think he did a lot of things um, that really showed leadership and boldness and innovation in economic development. And yet, if you looked at the actual goals that we had set out, the very specific goals, which were actually less specific than I argued for, but were still very specific, he failed miserably, right? Because because things changed. And all of a sudden, those goals that we had come up with just didn't matter anymore. But everything else he did, that actually mattered quite a bit. And, and what it taught me was, especially in this uncertain environment, especially given the fact that we don't know what's going to happen with COVID, um, what that taught me is it's better to keep these as broad priorities and objectives and goals, because then when we review the town manager a year from now, we have the ability to sort of interpret and apply those and not say, well, he didn't do these specific things we asked for. And so we have to give him bad marks, even though he did all of these other great things. So I want to lobby for keeping the goals as is right now, um, keeping them broad, keeping them tied to specific things the council has passed. Um, and, and sort of endorsing Alyssa's position of coming in with specifics later down after we've had more thorough discussions, but that not, aren't necessarily part of our initial goals that he takes on board. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I, we're going to take this. We're not going to vote on the goals tonight. We, are, we have to vote on them when we meet on the 14th. I think GOL can take one more look at them when some of these thoughts, I am going to add my own thought, and that is the following. Goals should never be looked at as individual. It is a matrix. So when you say you want to integrate this with that, with this, with that, what you should look at is say, these are our six goals uh, that are policy goals, and these are our five management goals. And then you should look at them as if they're a matrix against each other. And all of them integrate. If you try to write everything into each goal, you end up with something that is absolutely and completely not understandable. Mm -hmm. I could write a, a goal about the four major capital buildings, and I could talk about how we have to have racial and equity justice and how we have to have climate action and how we have to do this yeah. and that and the next thing. And by the time we get done, the building would look like junk. So what I'm saying is you can't look at a goal independent of all of the other goals. And so GOL is going to go back to this. George, one last comment, and then we're going to move on. Thank you, Lynn. And I, I realize it's late, and I appreciate you letting me say one last thing. Um, I feel like I have six goals here that I can take to my constituents and argue for passionately and strongly as goals that this council wants to accomplish. The specifics, we're gonna figure it out. But these are six things that I think we as a group believe in. And I've seen my own self change to some degree over the last couple of weeks. And so I'm proud of these and I can, I can go out and, and argue for them. But if we get to a level of specificity, things are gonna become much more complicated. So I think we should keep them broad and they should reflect, I hope, what is a consensus of the group. And um, Go forward with it. Okay. Okay. We're going to move on. Uh, the next item is the appointments of the town manager. Uh, Darcy, these, both of these came to TSO. The first one is the elementary school building committee. And would you please report on TSO and make the motion? Yes. I have the motion sheet in front of me. Um, yeah, the 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 first was the um, elementary school building committee. Yeah. 
And just one second. I can read it if you want. I, I have it here. I know, that's okay. Um, uh, so uh, we, we had a discussion of the, the three candidates um, and I don't, I submitted a report for, on that deliberation. Um, there were um, some concerns um, about, still looking for it here. Um, wait a minute. Okay. There were, there were just some concerns about um, Dwayne Chamble, uh, who works for the school district. Um, there were concerns uh, that the majority of the people that are on the elementary school building committee are employees of the district. Um, the vast majority of them are men. And we pointed out that an, a number of, uh, of um, qualified women had applied. Um, and the other issue was that um, there was concern that there was nobody on the committee who um, was uh, an expert in zero energy building, even though at least one person had applied. So, um, Dorothy and I ended up abstaining um, and the other three members voted for. So um, actually, Alyssa is going to make the motion here. Okay, Alyssa. I move to approve the following town manager appointments under charter section 2.11B to the elementary school building committee as recommended by the town services and outreach committee, Dwayne Chamble, Phoebe Merriam and Jonathan Salbin. Is there a second? Second, Ross. Okay. And Alyssa, do you want to speak to the motion? I just want to mention that you notice it doesn't have an end date, but that's because this is that very funny committee that's going to last forever. And so there didn't seem to be any point in putting an end date on it. It's done when it's done. And the other thing I wanted to clarify is with the uh, TSO report, it doesn't really represent all of the discussion in that there was some pushback on some of those comments. But I also do want to clarify that when it is stated publicly that women or people of certain abilities or characteristics or skills applied, this is all private through the town manager. So the only way that anybody knows that is if some individual told them I applied for that and he didn't recommend me. So I just don't want anyone in the public to think that the TSO or the full town council has any idea who applied for these positions because we don't know that except individuals may have approached individuals to share that information. It's just one of the little quirky parts of our process. Mandy Jo. Yeah, I wanted to express some concern about the report. Um, this was a unanimous vote in TSO because abstentions are not no's. Abstentions are a choice to choose not to vote. You are saying, I don't want to vote on this when you abstain. Yet the report only discussed um, reasons kind of for voting no, but there were no no votes. Um, and the report did not at all discuss reasons for voting in favor, which was the actual unanimous decision of the TSO. So I just wanted to express my concern about how this report was written, um, that it failed to include any reasons for why the three members who voted unanimously to support these recommendations actually made that vote um, and all. So that's all. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. I'm going to do the roll call. Uh, I believe this time I start with Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Abstain. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. 
Shalini Ball Milne. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Abstain. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. And Dorothy Pam. Abstain. So the motion passes 10 for, none against, three abstentions, none absent. Okay, moving on to the Human Rights Commission. Yes, um, the, um, the town manager put forward the um, uh, recommendations to fill positions in the Human Rights Commission. Um, uh, he was uh, away for the time period of our meeting and Jennifer Moyston came and um, and uh, put in a pitch for the different nominees, which was great because she's the staff to the committee um, and she's one of the community participation officers. Um, we heard, we uh, heard um, only good things about all the applicants um, and ended up unanimously recommending them for reappointment or for one of them for reappointment, the rest for appointment to um, to the to the recommended to the council to reappoint them and appoint them. <laughs> right. Do you want, shall I go ahead and make the motion, Dorothy? I can make that. <clears throat> go ahead. So the motion is to approve the following town manager appointments under Charter Section 211B to the Human Rights Commission as recommended by the Town Services and Outreach Committee for a term to expire June 30th, 2022, Sid Ferreira, a reappointment. For terms to expire June 30th, 2023, Cedric Garnett, Elizabeth Haygood, and Erica Loper. Is there a second? I Dark. second it. Thank you. Any further discussion at this time? Okay. We begin with George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Kalani Balmil. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Jo Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. Passes unanimously 13 4, none against, none abstain, none absent. Okay, we are now going to. into executive session. And so let me, don't anybody do anything yet, okay? This tape will keep running and it will have a sign on it that says the council is in executive session. And after executive session, we will all have to log back in and come in back into this meeting. But meantime, you have to log out of this meeting and Serge has sent you an individual invitation to a different Zoom login, okay? And so you need to go from that, this Zoom login to the other Zoom login, and then when we come back out of executive session, we will come back into this Zoom login. So make sure that somewhere in your calendar, although I'm sure, Athena will be glad to send it to us all again uh, that we know which to log back into. So I will see you in the other Zoom. No, no, no. Oh, oh, wait a minute. We need to vote in to go into executive session. Yes. Before we vote on an executive session, we were working on appointments. Why are we not finishing that process? Because we're going to go on to the next appointments after we come back out because we didn't want to be so late in the meeting going into executive session. 
We have to be late either way because there is a real discussion that has to happen around the appointments. And it feels like a manipulation. Now, it was not meant as a manipulation, believe me. Um, yeah, we probably have a lot of people waiting. Attendees. Okay, I wish somebody had told me they didn't agree with this when I sent you this the revised schedule, which I did earlier today. Um, when the town manager appointments are all together on the agenda. The town manager appointments are finished. And, the, and then in the agenda, it goes to the town council appointments to planning board. But in the order of the agenda that I sent to you, with the timing, which we're way off, I should always are the order different. Fine, we'll go to the town council appointments, planning board. Okay. Um, Community Resources Committee, Mandy Jo Haneke. Okay. So the Community Resources Committee met on August 26th in two separate meetings, um, one meeting to hold interviews and one meeting to make those discussions. The interviews were held with five individuals um, and lasted approximately an hour. After interviews, that meeting was adjourned and a new meeting was called to order to have a discussion about recommendations per the process that CRC has adopted. Those, that discussion is um, put forth in the memo that was dated August 27th. At the end of the discussion, CRC voted three to one with one absent to recommend the town council appoint to the planning board effective immediately for terms expiring June 30th, 2023. Johanna Newman, Tom Long, and Andrew McDougall. Um, you can read the report. Um, I don't think I need to go into any more detail unless people ask about that report. It includes both the reasons for the three votes in favor of this uh, recommendation and the one vote dissenting from the recommendation. So at this time, I'm going to make the motion to appoint the following individuals to the planning board per charter section 2.9C effective immediately as recommended by the Community Resources Committee for terms expiring June 30th, 2023, Johanna Newman, Tom Long, and Andrew McDougall. Is there a second? I'll Ryan, second. second. Could we separate those motions out? Um, and how I don't think we should separate them out. So uh, what Darcy did was just move to divide. If that gets a second, then there needs to be a motion. Then that needs to be voted on and receive a majority of votes to actually divide. Um, I, Lynn, I'm just not sure how to do this. I want to make a motion to postpone this discussion uh, for consideration after another item that I want to bring. Um, and I understand that I, it's a, a consideration for time certain as opposed to post just a motion to postpone. Um, and this was something not anticipated in 48 hours in advance. So I wanted to have another discussion before we get into the discussion of these of the actual appointments. Okay, um, Kathy did inform me of these and I did send them to you. Um, so your, mo your motion, Kathy, which I need to put before the council is to what? Okay, so according to the language that was sent to me, because I'm not good on this, uh, these motions in terms of the wording, it's move to postpone item 9B to a time certain for consideration 
after 14A, non anticipated 48 hours in advance. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. Um, the motion's been made and seconded. Is there further discussion? Uh, Shalini. Oh, my hand was up for the earlier one. So we're discussing right now Kathy's motion. Yes. Okay. I think that uh, regarding that, my perspective is that we proposed that last year and we didn't go ahead with it. The motion wait, that we're wait, discussing. What are we about? Wait, let me just read. Okay, I'm going to put my hand down and read this again. Hold on. Okay. The motion we're discussing is the motion to postpone item 9B to a time certain for consideration after item 14A, not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Evan. So I had some, I had my hand raised for something different as a CRC member. I wanted to add on to what Mandy said before we started this kangaroo process of people just yelling out what motions they want to make. Um, but I am, I am, 14B seems to be reconsideration of what we did last week. And I heard no rationale as to why we should postpone an appointment until after we, 14A? 14. Okay. That's where I got confused. Um, okay. I'll okay. Darcy? I don't have my hand up. Okay. Then take your hand down. Okay. So the motion on the table is to move to postpone item 9B to a time certain for consideration after item 14A, not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Is there any further discussion? This is a, this is a vote on the motion to postpone. Okay. That's all it is. Dorothy. I need, I need, um, let me just see. Yeah, I need this put into common of sense English, please. Um, I don't really know what it says and or what it means. So, I mean, I have an idea, but when I hear the language, I just, you know, it's hard to know what we're talking about. Mandy Zhao, do you want to explain? A vote yes on the motion on the table to postpone means that we would discuss Kathy's, well, the proposed motion under item 14A on associate members to the planning board prior to discussing appointments to the planning board. A vote no would mean we go ahead and discuss planning board appointments now and take up item 14A in the regular course of the agenda. Oh, I see. Okay. I, I get this. So 14A is planning board hyphen associate members, right? That's correct. So I guess I would agree that I would like to have that discussion before we have um, the other discussion. Okay. So, uh, George. And I think that we shouldn't vote in favor of this motion and that um, this discussion is something that should be taken up at some other time and now is not the time. Um, we have a CRC recommendation and I think we should address it and decide on it one way or the other. And I think this is, so I'm basically asking people to vote no on this so we can get back to the main issue at hand. Dorothy, is your hand up still? Oh no, I'm gonna. Um, yeah, I'm please lower take hand. your hands down. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Darcy? Yeah, I guess I would just um, uh, vote in favor of this because uh, I don't think it would take very long for Kathy to explain to us what it is that she is suggesting, and it might influence uh, how we all feel about the upcoming vote. Um, so uh, I I'd like to hear what her idea is. Steve Schreiber. I'm going to um, plus one to what my colleague Councilor Ryan said that, and actually for the reason many of you want to hear this right now, is because there are people waiting and the 48 hours item is a new item that will very doubtfully reach closure tonight. So I urge us to take action on this now 
while the night is still young for the fairness of those people who are candidates that are, are watching this. Yeah. Alyssa. I'll just say that I'm going to be voting against this motion. I think the associates idea is great. I don't think it is appropriately in the spirit of something that's unanticipated within 48 hours. I think we could have known weeks ago that we might want to consider associate members, just like we toyed with the idea over a year ago. And I understand it as a possible solution to a problem. And I think it can be addressed if the motion for the CRC recommendation fails. I don't think it needed to be done as a 48 hour item and I'm uncomfortable with the way that it is being done that way, but I think we can still get to it another way. Yes. So the motion on the floor that's been made and seconded is to move to postpone item 9B to a time certain for consideration after item 14A, not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Is there any other discussion? Shalini. Yeah, I, I also agree with Ryan and Steve, that and Alyssa, that, that if this is something we want to consider, we should do it as a separate thing. This is not how we advertised the position. This is not what the people came in interviewing for. And now to through that just because we want to resolve a difficult situation doesn't feel fair to the people but I am very interested in this um, possibility as I was last year and uh, and I think it should be done in a separate discussion any other comments okay then we're going to take the vote on this and we begin with Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Um, so a vote yes means that we would delay, that we would postpone, yes. Postpone, no. Andy Steinberg. No. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. No. Alyssa Brewer. No. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmers, no. Mandy Johanneke. No. Pam. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. No. And George Ryan. No. Okay, the motion is defeated. It is one, two, three, five, five for it, and eight no's and no abstentions. Okay, so that we are back to the original motion and the original motion that's on the table is to appoint the following individuals to the planning board per charter section 2.9 C effective immediately as recommended by the Community Resources Committee for terms expiring June 30th 2023 Johanna Newman Tom Long Andrew McDougal. Is there any further discussion? Evan. So this was the comment I wanted to make earlier, um, which is just adding on to Mandy's report um, as a CRC member, just to say um, as a former, as the former OCA chair, this having run through CRC for the first time, um, I just wanted to say that CRC followed OCA's process um, almost identically, the conversation looked uh, very similar to the conversation OCA had about ZBA. Um, and so the process was the same that was used for ZBA and OCA and for planning board. And I was happy to see uh, as former OCA chair, the OCA process carried forward and implemented again with one slight change, which was the utilization of the statements of interest, um, which I think that 
uh, CRC members can agree were incredibly useful, valuable, and provided us far more information than the CAF. So before we get into what might be a contentious conversation, I wanted to recognize uh, that the OCA process once again has worked, has been fruitful, and that the SOI I think was a really good decision. I wanna thank the council for having supported that when it was brought forward as an OCA recommendation. Shalini. Okay, so first I just wanna apologize for not making it to this very important meeting due to a conflict that I could not avoid. Um, so I wanted to make my statement here and spend several hours going through all the interviews and the statements of interest and, and beyond. Um, and, you know, just based on the feedback we've been getting and what um, the discussion itself, I mean, it is contentious and we all, uh, different people have different points of view. So I just want to invite everyone to pause and and consider what might be the reasons why other people have these different perspectives before we jump to any kind of assumptions about why we think certain people are voting in a certain way. We can just really take this time to understand and each other's perspective and why we are uh, making the choices we're making. And maybe in this process, we might shift our views. So I wanted to run by you what my thought process was. The question that I kept holding as I went through all the different pros and cons of the different candidates was the question, what is the best for all of Amherst given our town goals? And not just for the people who are attending these meetings, not just the people who wrote to us, but also let's keep in mind all the residents who are affected by our decisions. So when I hold that question, my first question was, what are our town goals and what are the current skill sets that we have? So we have with us in the planning board, an architect, a campus planner and slash architect, a hydrology scientist and a lawyer. And what we lost last year with Greg Stutzman was we lost a business perspective. And we know that we are in an economic crisis. I mean, I was always in favor of economic vitality. And by that, let me clarify, I do not mean development as in the sixth, because every time we talk about economic vitality, it seems there is a sense in among some residents and maybe some counselors as well, we're talking about the six and seven or five, whatever story buildings, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the economic vitality that is needed, which supports the restaurants that immigrants own, the BIPOC people own downtown. I'm talking about the doctors who are complaining. I've spoken to several doctors and entrepreneurs and spinoffs out of UMass who have complained to me over and over again that the zoning bylaws make it so hard for them and expensive because every time they have uh, to come to the planning board and they send back again and because it's a, a, a goofiness of our zoning bylaws, they need to get an architect, they need to get um, lawyers and that's costing them thousands of dollars and I have a doctor who's told me she is telling all her doctor friends to not open any clinic in Amherst because of that. Anyway, that is one person's perspective. And again, I don't want to make that everyone's, but I have spoken with other entrepreneurs who have that feeling. So it is really important as far as I'm concerned um, to have that perspective, which we do not have. When we talk about diversity of perspective on our boards, that is a perspective we do not have right now and which I did feel that Andrew McDougall brought to the board. And when I went ahead and read his um, description, um, he also talked about the other goals that we have of social justice. In fact, he was one of the few people who brought that up. Um, and in terms of very specific expertise that he brings, he talked about extensive experience identifying 
cost saving revenue growth opportunities within retail distribution. So anyway, he has a lot of amazing expertise having worked with federal and local governments and planning boards, which I think would be amazing for us to have in our thing. The other thing that I thought very interesting about Tom was um, his mentioning the human, um, human centered design that perspective that he brings. And you have heard me say that before, we are in a very interesting time, very crazy time and interesting time, and we need skill sets that are going to engage the community in a way like we've never done before. And we need new and innovative ways of thinking that I thought that Tom brings uh, with the human-centered approach in creating spaces. So when we're looking at downtowns or how can we make them walkable? How do we make them safe and engaging? I think we're going to use both of these skill sets that these people bring. Um, when I talk, when we think about experience, because that's another thing that's been talked a lot, is uh, that uh, we will be losing experience of Mr. Bert Russell, and I agree that that is. Uh, that is, of course, true that he has been there for three years and he brings that experience. But that, to me, also is experience that can be gained and learned. I mean, we saw that with Janet McGovern, who joined, and in one year, she has been an amazing participant. So it's not it's not so much about experience, because the same people who are saying this year they want experience were last year willing to let go of experience and the people who said they wanted experience last year are letting go of experience so it's not about experience really in the way we're thinking it's, it's about skill sets that are relevant right now um, in terms of experience itself what i'm seeing the three candidates proposed by CRC, the kind of experience they are bringing cannot be gained by uh, sitting on a planning board for two years or three years or 10 years. What we're hearing is these people are bringing in organizational um, skills, work skills, working with planning boards, working with uh, different innovative ways of thinking that, that are very innate. And I would love to see them on our board right now. The third thing I want to say, I know this is going on and on, but I just want to make up for the time not having been there at the CRC meeting. Um, I think one thing that we also have to realize is that um, there are huge challenges coming up with affordable housing, uh, with economic crisis, and in addition to climate change. So I don't think status quo is what we're looking for. We do need, I really do believe that we want skill sets that are innovative, that are going to be able to think out of the box, that are going to be able to engage the communities and work and in building coalitions. Um, one thing that I struggled the most with was, does this feel like we're insulting uh, an existing board member who is committed, who's shown up, who's worked hard, and by not reappointing them? And so I turned that question to myself, that if I was in in his position, how would I feel? And I feel very strongly that, yeah, we're gonna be up for voting uh, next year. And just because I showed up, because I worked hard, there is no guarantee that people are gonna vote for me again. And so just because people have shown up and done their hard work and, and truly I know it is amazing sacrifices that everyone who's volunteering is making. And I'm so grateful for everyone who is volunteering. So this is not meant to be disrespectful to anyone who I am not suggesting be reappointed, but it goes with the terrain that when we volunteer, there's a possibility that there will be people who will come up with the relevant skill sets. And, and it's not a guarantee that we will be reappointed again or revoted in again. So I'm hoping that this is my my vote is not seen as disrespect to people who have shown up. But I just think that the situation demands that we look at the kind of skill sets we need to build collaboration, to build coalition, to engage the community, and to bring in perspectives that we don't currently have. So with that, I would render my support to the existing um, um, people suggested by the CRC. 
Kathy. Um, you know, I appreciate Shelley, your walking through your thinking. And I just want to go back to a process that we've set up. And I would like to honor the process we set up. We set up uh, criteria that we were going to be looking at. Um, we actually said, I think, when uh, OCA uh, was ended, that we would abide by guidelines, not just the way they were doing things. And the guidelines had were, as of May, when we, and other things, was to give a preference to someone who's committed to one full term for a second term, unless there was a really strong reason not to. And so I just want to speak for the candidate where the applicant that we're not talking about, who's Michael Burtwistle. We received over 25 emails from people. And these were from people that had worked with him on the planning board, that had worked with him as he's been the planning board representative on Community Preservation Act Committee and on the Design Review Board. Strongly positive to the fact that he does think out of the box. This is not a just think about one thing. He comes to every meeting, and I've been the liaison to CPA. He comes to every meeting incredibly prepared, having really thought through, and in that, their people are applying for a money, um, with a very strong commitment to affordable housing um, and well articulated. He's always prepared. And the kinds of comments we got about him go with what the past, the outgoing chair said she was advising the council to adhere to, which was the same criteria we adhered to the last two times we've done um, either zoning board or planning board under OCA. And it, um, she talked about knowledge of the community issues, knowledge of the master plan, zoning bylaws, understanding of the regulatory function of the board, what is the planning board, understanding the way they go about the work and how a seasoned person an experienced person keeping a mix. And so I want to remind everyone, we're not talking about putting three people who have all been on the board for four or five years. We're talking about reappointing one person potentially and putting two brand new people. And I'd like, Lynn, I sent um, a, a PowerPoint chart that I want to show. We have right now a quite inexperienced board. Um, there are two people with four years of service, um, so they will, their terms expire at very times. There's one person that has far less than a year, was just appointed um, at the end of May or June, and one person who's just at a year. And so we're, we're talking about adding one reappointment to the mix of the four that now exist, and two brand new that in the interviews, and I sat through it in real time, um, we have three people that came up through CRC as being um, recommended. But if they are all committed and we put two of them on this board, then they will be here next year. I mean, we are starting to get um, a healthy mix of people out there. This doesn't go away. We have two appointments opening up potentially next year and the year after. Um, and attending board meetings, we've had people drop off because of the um, extent of which the hours have been required. And I just want to read, because when I said we had 25 comments, um, I'm just going to read a couple excerpts from people. I've attended, this is someone who's an observer of the planning board. I've attended, physically attended the planning board meetings before COVID for the past 18 months and have been impressed with Michael's thoroughness in preparing a in preparing and conscientious question. He often brings up points no one else has thought of and is led in a way to be questioning with the foundation of the master plan, which he knows very well. He is also representative of the Planning Board of CPA and Design Review Board. He attends those meetings religiously and reports on them to the rest of the board. He's the only one who is a liaison to two committees. There is rarely a site visit that he has missed. In fact, I found him to be one of the hardest workers on the Planning Board. Another colleague who worked with him on CPA 
wrote, I worked with Michael for two years on the CPA committee, which I chaired. He was a diligent committee member who rarely missed a meeting, was always prepared, easily engaged in thoughtful discussion, and rarely had comments that weren't important to hear. He was a vigorous defender of taxpayer dollars and equally enthusiastic about the mission of CPA. Michael is blunt and entirely irascible, but he was never bullheaded or stubborn in our deliberations. He was comfortable acknowledging when amidst a conversation or a presentation, he had changed his mind. This combination of forcefulness with flexibility was refreshing. And I think his style encouraged other members to articulate their own concerns about a project, even when they felt their opinions were going against perceived consensus. And then the last one I didn't want to do. Kathy, are these ones that we all received? Yes. Yeah, so the last one I just want to point out was from a colleague on the planning board who said, in effect, he's done nothing that we wouldn't expect of a planning board. And by not reappointing him, we could be considered to be firing him. And he hasn't done anything that would lead to that conclusion. And it's a scary thing because future applicants might think if the, or board members might think if they speak up, if they have a different point of view, they too will be terminated. I don't think we want to be sending that signal. So I strongly urge people to consider Michael Burtwistle as one of the three and to appoint two new people. So we will have two new people along with existing people on the board. Kathy, are you making a motion? Um, I, I think I am, Lynn, so I would make a motion that we appoint Michael Burtwistle to a three-year term. And I don't know how to do that in the context of another motion that has three other names. It you would need it. to be a motion to amend that removes one name and replaces it with his. Exactly. And let me just ask, Darcy asked, do we have to do it as a group? Because I I would prefer to hear a discussion on each of the other three. Um, I'm... I did attend the meeting and I did listen to what Shalini just said. Um, so if we're talking about Michael Burkwistle plus two other people, I would like to hear some discussion on who the other two should be. What is the right compliment? Rather than me picking two. I could pick two. I have the ability to do that. You know, I'm comfortable with the other three. Um, you know, as Shalini listed, they are different. Um, I'm comfortable with a conversation about each of the other two people, but I really want to bring Michael Burtwistle in as one of the names to be considered for a three-year term. I think the only way to proceed is that there be an amendment to the motion. All right. Well, I can make one kind of amendment, which would be, I, I amend the motion, and I make a motion to appoint Michael Burtwistle to a three-year term to be effective immediately. And that's my initial amendment. So if you want me to- so That's like dividing the motion. You can, no. Because even if the motion's divided, there's still three names, and one of them needs deleted in order to replace it with Michael Burtwistle. Okay, right. All right, so if you're going to make me make a choice and I listened to Shalini, then I would pick uh, d delete um, Tom Long because we have two architects already on the board and I'm hoping that he will apply should one of them leave or we can reconsider next year and to leave Andrew McDougall and Johanna on as the other two who would be new to the board. So it would be Michael Burke Whistle. Andrew and Johanna. I second that. All right, so the, in effect, the motion is to amend the original motion by removing the name of Tom Long and replacing it with the name of Michael Burt Wessel. Is that how it you is, It motion? is because I am being put into the box of having to have three. Um, as I said, I would prefer to go right into Michael Burt so, but yes, I am comfortable with that group of three people. Okay, Sarah, do you have a comment? So I don't wanna take up a lot of time 
And I wanted people to respect OCA's process. And as part of CRC, I want to be respectful to CRC. Um, I wanted to make the point that um, I'm not flip-flopping on anything that I said when we first tried to make these appointments a year ago. I introduced one new person out of seven, and it was a, there was it, it was green, but it wasn't it this the planning board was not as green as it is right now. I have not I have not changed my thinking. I also want to say that in soul searching this, um, for me, I found that this is not about a person or a bias for me. This is about how I feel about process and how I feel about equity versus political thinking. Um, and in that, I'm going to say I'm a terrible politician, <laughs> found that out. But process is important to me because I believe it does create equity in government. Planning board is not elected, it's appointed. And that's a really big difference. And for me, I feel like when we're looking for people to serve and we're trying to get people to come and serve, I think that they need to have a feeling that they will be judged on the same rules as another person. Meaning there are hard and fast rules that people need to reach in order to get elected or to get, ah, see, to get appointed or to get reappointed to that. And I, one big difference in the process was that um, the thing that OCA spent the longest amount of time on, which was term limits, was changed. And I was not there for that discussion. Um, so, but term limits, are something that we've we argued about. And I said every single thing that Shalini did, I'm I, I right on, because that's everything that I said. And when I said that, George said to me, if you have hard and fast term limits, it would make our lives much easier. Oh, two terms, you're done, next. And that, and that may be what the committee decides to do. But the, the very way that this has been phrased right now, um, and in keeping uh, with it, um, we do not have hard term limits. It makes our job harder, but perhaps more realistic. Maybe I'm the only one who feels like we are dancing around the simple fact that there is an undeniable political element to these two bodies, Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals. And if you are not happy with planning and zoning for whatever reason, then you are probably eager to see some kind of changes and you're going to be looking for fresh faces or, or people whose views are closer to what you imagine they would be, but would be the right views. And that seems to be a fact uh, of, of these two boards. That doesn't bother me that it's political. What does bother me is the idea that we are going to have hard term limits so that we will not regularly have these discussions. And what I've realized is, is I don't think it's political and I don't think it's about a person, uh, one particular person. I think that we need to, one of the things that we didn't do um, in CRC, we went through this process, was that we did not talk about why somebody would or would not be reappointed. In OCA, we started to, we said they were someone who showed up. They were someone that the, that the um, met the criteria of, the um the the chairman and that they needed to be prepared all the time we did not have that discussion at all and so for me i think it comes down to the fact that i don't want us to flip-flop on our decisions every single time we can only do that so much before it's very obvious why we're flip-flopping and I, I don't mean this as um, a condemnation of anyone because, you know, perhaps the way I'm looking at this is very naive. And perhaps it would be better if, more effective as a politician, if I supported someone who always supported my views. Um, so again, I'm gonna say the same thing that I said the last time we were here, which for me, this is not political. Thank you. Darcy. Um, yeah, I would, I would uh, agree with Sarah on that, um, that the 
my main concern is that the, the selection criteria that was used by CRC um, that effectively excluded or fired Michael Burtwistle um, from the planning board was, um, was changed. It was changed from the selection criteria that OCA had passed to it and from the selection criteria, the term limit selection criteria that, that has been used historically in town. And so the rule that has historically been used gives preference to members who are in good standing to serve for a second full term for up to six years. That's what the OCA rule said. Um, and that rule balances the reason for it, for giving the preference after the first term for reappointment is that it balances. It, it balances the need for experience on a committee um, with um, the opportunity to appoint, appoint new members. So after the first term, the preference is for the experience. After six years, two, two three-year terms or six years, then the preference shifts to looking for new fresh faces, which wasn't, Michael Burtwistle had not um, come up to that point of where we would be looking for new faces to replace him. His experience is, is what is valuable. Um, so um, after six years, it's assumed that new folks sh should be preferred, um, at least if they're available. So this is a rule the town has had in its committee handbook. And that, as I said, OCA passed on to the CRC. And as Rob Crowner, who um, is someone who wrote an email to the town council in the last day, uh, said it, it honors the town's custom of allowing board members in good standing to serve for two full terms, to grow into and confidently exercise the skills and knowledge gained during the first term, and to take a formal or informal leadership or mentoring role during the second term. Um, and he went on to say, has that not been the rule in Amherst up to now? Isn't that the rule that was also carried on by OCA and passed to the CRC? Um, and isn't that the rule that has also been used in town committees? So I, I served on OCA um, and we put a lot of time into developing that selection criteria that we passed to the CRC. Um, and um, the term limit piece was the only thing that the CRC changed um, which seemed like a political move um, because of their awareness of that Michael Bert Whistle was the only member of the planning board who was up for reappointment. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> I urge the council not to feel bound by a recommendation that was made using that selection criteria. Um, because our our real selection criteria in Amherst is time honored, um, and I hope that you will vote for reappointment of Michael Burt Whistle, based on that experience, and give him the chance to have that additional term, um, so that he can use the experience. He's so committed, he's knowledgeable, and has a broad understanding of planning and zoning. So I hope that you will look to that Amherst tradition and follow it. Driver. Yeah, so um, I think you all know that I'm a member of the CRC that voted. I was part of the group that voted three to one. I think you also all know that I was 10 years on the planning board, including my last, I think it was two or three years as chair. And I also served with one of the candidates for two and a half years on the planning board. So I just wanna be clear that the way that I'm approaching this is that I believe it's our ethical obligation to field the best 
possible team. So our job, and it's an incredibly important job that we have, we, we staff the, the planning board and we staff the zoning board of appeals. We do the evaluation of the town manager. Those are the personnel issues that we get involved with. So the selection of the planning board is something that we should be, is one of the most important decisions that we make. And I strongly believe that just like fielding a baseball team, that we, it's our obligation to field that planning board with the, the, basically to curate the best possible board at that particular moment. So this happens to be a moment in which we had a number of good applicants, including the incumbent. And I, I feel, you know, I feel strongly that the three that we chose as the top are the most appropriate for this moment. I also believe that these are three newcomers to the Amherst town politics. I don't believe that any one of them has ever served in town government before. And I think it's incredibly exciting that we were able to recruit them to apply, go through this grueling process and be candidates in this. So we should be, you know, we should be very excited about that. Honestly, I dismiss all of the letters that have been written to us because I find that letter writing to be exceptionally unfair to all of the other candidates, especially the ones that are the front runners. They had no idea that they were supposed to be soliciting friends to writing testimonials about them. So the fact that they don't have testimonials and that another candidate does have testimonials, I give no weight to. So, um, and I don't believe that any of us should give weight to, you know, to those letters because we were not asking for letters of reference. Um, everyone keeps saying wait till next year. So, you know, one of the three candidates can wait till next year. That same message can be given to the other candidates. Whoever does not prevail tonight, that's the exact same message, wait till next year. So we all know about a ZBA candidate that was taken off, applied again the next year, was put back on. Actually, in the pool of six that we originally were considering was a former planning board member who had more experience. So he had taken time off of the planning board and was basically applying again. So there's also been a discussion about the uh, service of um, Mike Burt Whistle to other committees. So those other committees, he is the planning board liaison to that. And I, I don't have the planning board rules in front of me. The planning board liaisons are not always sitting members of the planning board. I believe that the DRB is oftentimes a past planning board member. I have no idea how this vote will shake out tonight. But however this decision happens tonight does, does not and should not be considered also a vote for the DRB and for the community, the CPA um, committee. So um, that's what I have to say. I believe that the CRC worked in due diligence on this. It was incredibly grueling decision because there are sort of the known quantities and the not known quantities. The known quantities generated a lot of letter writing and testimonials tonight. The not known quantities generated zero. But I, that's a factor of the fact that they don't understand this process and it should not be seen as whatsoever as a any kind of evidence that they also don't have that kind of support or much more. So I urge you to vote no on the motion on the table and I urge you to welcome three new faces to town government. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Thank you. Um, Jorge Lopez. Hopefully I'm gonna be a little shorter than some of my colleagues. Um, if I dance back to what Chalene talked about when she talked about expertise uh, and the specific um, credentials of Tom and Andrew. Uh, she omitted Johanna. And I'm going to, um, and, and I, would, I would omit Johanna as well. She brings um, great work in terms of environmental issues um, but she has no experience as an architect, as a designer, as a landscape architect. She um, brings very little experience um, to the planning board. She would have the most to learn. Uh, and 
I feel like let's get honest. If you want experience, then you have that in Michael Burtwistle, who I support um, in her place. And I'm going to read a very short section of a letter we all received uh, from Nate Buddington. Um, and, and I asked his permission. And because what he's speaking to is a little different than pro professional expertise uh, and the importance of a variety of opinions and people and a diversity of people. He's, he says many things, um, but one of the things he says is I acknowledge there is a growing interest in populating town boards with people who possess a specific professional expertise. That's a good thing. But there needs to be room for knowledgeable amateurs who have good judgment, quick minds, intellectual flexibility, and a collaborative approach to their work. There also should be space for devoted contrarians who use their original thinking to make committee deliberations more thoughtful and expansive. Michael is modestly contrarian in my opinion, but I learned from his ability to think originally and from his overall collegial demeanor. So I'm gonna throw another thing into the mix. I think that we should um, vote down all three candidates and then vote for them one at a time and vote for Michael Burtwistle and two other people. I think it's, I think that we're sort of playing here and I don't think that that's anybody's intention. Um, but I think it's very interesting that you can dismiss letters uh, from uh, people. It's interesting to me that you can say we need professional expertise and then choose someone who doesn't have it. It's interesting that the criteria for, from both the planning board and from CRC had to do with experience. And it's ongoingly uh, important to me that we have trouble with appointments. And I see that trouble in, as now that I'm a, li a liaison to the Disability Access um, Advisory Committee, that appointments are handled very strangely and at the whim of, and Paul, I don't mean this in completely negatively, at the whim of the town manager in that case, and the whim of a group of people who aren't looking at, I think, the real, intricacy of collaboration and the intricacy of establishing and building community trust. And I feel like, well, that's enough. Anyway, I, I, I guess I, I don't know whether I'm proposing a motion, I, Robert's Rules of Order or whatever, uh, but I very much feel like we either need to vote for each of these people individually, and that includes Michael Burt Whistle, um, or we need to reject the whole slate and then decide who we do want. Are you calling the question? I guess so. Am I Mandy Jo? What other people who want to speak? I'm sorry, what? S Alyssa, what? If you call the question, no, the, nobody else can talk. No, oh, okay. if, call, if she wants to end debate and go to a vote on the motion, she calls the question and it requires two thirds of the council to vote in favor of ending debate for it to pass. Uh, I need directly to a vote on the motion to amend. Alyssa, what should I do? I'm really asking. <laughs> well, there are, there are people, quite a number few people have their hands raised. So. Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead. I won't call the question yet. Dorothy. Okay, um, those letters were not testimonials. Those letters were protest letters. They were letters of dissent with a decision that they saw as being egregiously wrong. They thought the decision was one that would um, stifle people from volunteering for committees if they thought they could be thrown out like an old shoe for the new flavor of the month. Now, 
when I'm feeling generous, I can say perhaps the committee was very excited because there were some really good, interesting candidates, old as well as new. And it's exciting to, to see different people. But the idea that you would think that you don't need Michael Burt whistle on that board, I find absolutely ridiculous. When the former chair was not reappointed after a much longer term, there was all the argument that you needed experience. And then during your discussion, which I did listen to completely, um, it was like, oh, well, maybe experience. We, we said that, but you know, it really ran well. Yes, it ran well because it had Michael Burt whistle on it, who has great experience, who is very intelligent, who's an original thinker, did his work, and it helped do it. So now if you remove Michael Burt whistle, who has all the most experience, even though you put these wonderfully talented new people who I am very excited about. I liked all of them. And I also liked the old person, Bob Greeny, all qualified people. Um, it doesn't mean that it will run as well without that experience. So um, Shalini talked about the importance of showing up and doing your work, but that's not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about intelligence. I'm talking about independence. I'm talking about integrity. Those are the qualities that make a candidate a very exciting and integral and necessary. But now if I put my cynical hat on it, I will say I knew he wasn't going to be reappointed before I even heard a single one of the new candidates. Now, how can I know that? Because it's been in the air and we all knew it. So the planning board is very important. We have a very fine candidate who should be reappointed and we have some wonderful other candidates. I think we should be excited about that. And instead of creating a situation which makes people lose faith in the planning board, in the town council, in the appointment process, in giving your all to a committee and then being just treated very rudely. I, I think we should include Michael Burtwistle as, to, as a candidate to be voted onto the planning board and to choose two of the other two. The one, and it's, you know, they're all talented. They're all people who'd be very good, but we have new openings coming up. But Michael Burtwistle will not apply for that again in the future after being treated this way. And I think you know that. So the new people who I'm very excited about will have plenty of chance to add their voices to making Amherst a wonderful town, bringing their views and sharing their views. But I feel that without Michael Burtwistle on the, on the planning board, you have really weakened it and weakened its independence and created a situation where people lose trust in us, the town council, as well as the planning board. Andy? So there's several things. Uh, one is that um, a couple, one of the letter writers and one other commenter used the term firing. And, I don't, and uh, Shalini um, responded to that earlier, and I don't want to spend much time on it because of the hour, but it was it, it's about not reappointing because of the reasons that a committee um, is uh, already stated. Uh, but it isn't, but the term firing is really not what this is about. Um, there's been comparisons to the situation last year with Greg Stutzman and having been one who argued very strongly for Greg, I want to point out that um, the reason that I did that last year was because as a member of CRC last year, I was not reappointed to CRC, so I'm not on the current um, committee that made this recommendation. Um, we tried to um, learn as much as we could about zoning and the master plan. And the one person from the planning board who continuously came to our meetings, took the time in the olden days when we actually met in the town room and people had to physically come, and was there and ex explained 
with clarity what the history of the master plan, what the history of zoning was and how they related and answered our questions in tremendous detail with an, and had a tremendous amount of preparation to it was Greg. And um, that um, it made me really appreciate an exceptional uh, amount of experience as somebody who has been on it and is, was um, chair for a very short period of time then. And I, um, with all respect for Michael, I don't think that they're comparable. And the last thing that I want to say is that um, we just talked about some um, the goals for the town and the goals for the council and the town manager and climate action, community health and safety, economic vitality, major capital investments, um, housing affordability, racial equity and social justice. In addition, we talked about wanting a well-managed town a well-managed town provides municipal school and library services we value. Some of these goals cannot be achieved without a master plan and zoning bylaw that is consistent with them. All of the goals require resources. We all know that Proposition 2 limits uh, growth and property tax revenue, which is our largest uh, source of stable funds without an override or new growth. And uh, we we're just able to maintain current services with the revenue available without an override. That leaves nothing for new initiatives. And even current services are at risk when an increase in inflation or an unforeseen crisis such as we're facing now comes along. Um, and regular responsible growth is therefore essential. I really commend the CRC for an interview process that elicited views of candidates that demonstrate their imagination and their experience to develop and implement zoning and advance council goal, the advance council goals. The CRC analysis then identified three candidates who are best prepared to meet that challenge. And I appreciate their approach and their recommendation. Felony? Yes. So I would really appreciate if people did not say that we did this or chose that, or I wasn't even there. But the reason we're doing this is for political reasons, because I'm hoping that having worked together for a year and a half, we've all voted all over the place. And I'm hoping that each of us can see that in each other, that we really bring in our own thinking and perspective here. So let's, and in fact, the political thing for me might be to actually vote yes for Michael. That would be the easier thing to do. But the harder thing is to actually reflect and go in and, and do something that aligns with my integrity and ethics, which, I am looking at is what are the skill sets that will, and that was my position last time too, what will make the planning board skill sets the strongest? And again, when we look at these very specific skill sets of these are the things we've been talking about in the last month where, for example, with the, um, the multidisciplinary practices are highly focused on human-centered design, placing the lived experience of community members at the center of the design practice. Uh, I'm talking about um, Tom. And he's worked with many city and public approval processes for public projects, gaining insight into the goals, priorities, and collaborative processes that towns and cities use. So he has not been on a planning board, but he's worked with planning boards, and he's worked in amazing projects at international levels. Like he's, he was a designer and collaborator and completed the memorial for the abolition of slavery in Nantes, France. I mean, this is the caliber of skill sets we have the chance to bring to our council. And we're saying, oh, no, let, let him apply next year. Do you think he will apply? Has anyone ever who's been rejected um, applied? I mean, some people who are so busy and 
we don't know whether they're going to apply or not. And so is this a skill set we want to lose? And then in response to Pat's question about Johanna and what does she bring, let's look at her, her uh, work experience. And she's been an organizer and advocate around environmental and public interest issues. Climate change is one of the most important goals we have over here. And she's trained and experienced in facilitation of groups strategic planning, coalition building, community outreach, communication, and more. And we know that she brings in the environmental and we need the coalition building, we need the community outreach. As we consider zoning bylaws, we want to make that process as transparent and engage the community at every level. And she's gonna bring in those skill sets of how do we organize the, the meetings and community. I mean, these are skill sets that we cannot ignore. And really just think about this, forget about the personalities, forget about the people, think about just the skill sets of the people and, and see how hard it is. So at least give us credit that we're not doing it for political reasons. I've, I didn't even have the, forget about the idea that we planned the whole change in the CRC because Michael was the, was, I mean, I didn't even know Michael was going, I mean, I, I was so clueless that I even missed the CRC meeting. So to think that I was planning so much ahead that I changed the whole CRC process to make that happen is really very uh, disrespectful to the fellow counselors who are working pretty hard to be fair about this. Alyssa? Exhausting, we'll try and talk fast. So many of the people writing to us despite their experience in town government seem to have forgotten a couple of things that is until we had a town council there was zero i repeat zero transparency around who had applied for appointments to volunteer positions whether they were appointed directly by the select board directly by the town manager or confirmed by the select board and yet despite decades of having always done it that way we all agreed as a town council we wanted much more transparency in our appointments. And that leaves us in a mess. That's just the case. It's been stated over and over again that it would alienate people who applied and were turned down, who were rejected, who were fired, as well as people who wouldn't even bother to apply because they fear that risk. We've been told repeatedly there are people who don't want to risk their professional reputation by applying for something and being turned down. Yet we decided we wanted a more transparent process for our appointments. So as awkward as this is, and this is a really grueling conversation that is taking a huge amount of time, we should actually pat ourselves on the back for doing what we said we thought was really important. The other thing that many of our writers forget is that there was in fact no automatic reappointment after one three year term, not when it was made by the elected select board, not when it was made by the elected town council, although it's true, it's often been the position of the appointed town manager, who in fact generally does not evaluate what you or I might consider good standing in the same way that our elected bodies have been doing. As Darcy said, there's still an appointed committee handbook that says a preference is for a second term. It's true. CRC changed the language that OCA used. And you might all remember me saying, hey, if you guys are going to change anything, you better have a really good reason for it. I'm not sure this needed to be changed, but I would argue that they really only modified it slightly because they still use the definition of a healthy body being a mix of people. Speaking of the CRC process, I'm not fond of the, of the idea that CRC didn't find it valuable as part of their process to ascertain whether any of the applicants being recommended indicated they in fact had any familiarity with the actual work of the Amherst Planning Board by having watched or analyzed any of their meetings versus just having really interesting ideas and skills. But that's an argument I had at OCA and I lost it there too. So I'm not surprised that CRC didn't ask that question or try it and listen it in a statement of interest. I hope we'll consider doing that in the future. I think we all have very different perspectives on what happened last year. I, my perspective is that last year's challenge was over at whether it made sense to appoint someone beyond six years, as well as balancing that with the most needed set of skills at that particular moment. Some of us were swayed one way, some of us were swayed the other. Michael, of course, has not served six years. I don't know why we'd put him in for three years when he's already served four years 
I would have assumed two would make sense if that is the case that we would move toward because I do not see why we would make it seven. Um, something I said as an OCA member at all these book meetings we all go to is that it's awkward to say, but applying over and over, just like running for office over and over, doesn't mean you get to get appointed or elected. Even if you run for two elected offices at the very same time, it still doesn't mean that despite all your efforts that you're going to win at some point. I mentioned at town council more than once that the approach you know, was long thought out at OCA. We did an amazing report, thanks largely to Evan, of trying to capture like every conversation we had at OCA so that you all would have that. One of the ways that our extensive written documentation let CRC down was in how to approach deliberation. I watched the meeting. I have offended someone already by saying, I feel like it went off the rails pretty early on because it was really awkward when they said, let's start deliberation. Okay, nobody wants to talk because it's incredibly awkward to talk about individuals. But almost immediately, it was glommed on to two seats. Here's one seat, we're gonna put it aside. Here's the other seat, we're gonna put it aside. Now we've got everybody else competing for one seat left. I just felt like that was really not the approach that was helpful in terms of looking at the whole committee and how everybody fits together, right? Because you're looking at the people who are still saying and the people who you're considering coming in. I understand the purpose of trying to come to consensus and a straw vote early on. Oka did some of that too, but fairly rapidly, two seats were set aside, thus leaving the rest to compete for one seat. That felt really especially inappropriate to me given that the reappointment hadn't been discussed. Reflecting back to like an hour ago, um, when people were talking about the actual reappointment, it was mentioned very early, but then, you know, the conversation went a different direction with all good intentions, and it never came back to, hey, wait, what did we decide was going to be our criteria for whether or not someone was going to get reappointed? That, to me, felt like it needed to happen much earlier in the conversation. I would argue that there with those who have said there's no reason not to reappoint Michael beyond you know the reasonable service he's attended regularly he's done his work he's offered his insights and I will say I watched a recent planning board meeting that was extremely fraught and extremely unpleasant during the section that I watched um, before we got some emails about that and he was very calm and logical during that particular meeting so I have no fault with his service I do understand I really do the perspective on how do we balance theoretical term limits, right? Theoretical preference for one or the other, which CRC softened a little bit, but I would argue they left in the healthy mix concept versus the idea of really capturing that new and exciting energy, even if they know nothing about our particular planning board. So I'm gonna just go ahead and say this because we have different opinions on what political means. In my world, after serving in elected office for almost 20 years, the message that it sends when you say, we have the votes, then it doesn't, that's saying it doesn't matter what message you send to the people who don't have the votes. It's really important to understand that yes, there are majority votes on this council and other places, but we have to think about the message we're sending to future applicants and to people who are currently serving, whether we think we can muscle a vote through or not. I understand that no one sitting here thinks they muscled a vote through. I'm telling you, there are people in the community, not just the people who wrote to us, who feel like that's what's happening. So good luck explaining that that's not what's happening because that's the perception out there. And it doesn't matter if that's not why you're doing it. It matters that the perception is there. So I just ask us to try and calm down with the, it's political, it's not political. I'm a politician, I'm not a politician. It doesn't matter what you label yourselves. The perceptions are out there. George. I think to follow up on what Alyssa just said that the message that I think I'm trying to send is to steal from Steve, that we're trying to feel what we think is the best team um, I'm appreciative of what CRC did because they really forced me to think hard about what actually are the criteria 
that we use for uh, putting people on these very important bodies. And while certainly service is important, and Mr. Burt Whistle has, has done fine service, it also occurs to me that that's exactly what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to come to meetings. He's supposed to show up. He's supposed to do his homework, right? That's, that's what he's supposed to do. So is that enough? And I, in some cases, that might be enough. Um, but this year, it seems to me that by itself is not necessarily enough. First of all, I assume that's what everybody does. Um, so that's, there's nothing heroic about that. That's what he's asked to do. Um, so for me, what really boils down to is what are the best candidates for the planning board right now? And what excited me about what CRC did is they took a real chance. They knew this was going to be very, very unpopular. They knew people were going to see it in a certain way. But they finally came around and I was impressed by the deliberation. I didn't have the same reaction Alyssa did. She's right, it is very difficult. Um, and it's, it's awkward and it's slow and it's cumbersome, but they worked their way through it. And they came to the conclusion that these were the three best candidates. Um, and that's what to me, I'm appreciative of what they did because it forced me to think, is it ultimately just a matter of looking and say, okay, so-and-so served for, for three years and came to the meetings and did his homework, you know, and is a reasonable person, good enough, he gets, the, he gets automatically reappointed. And I think the message that we're trying to send is that's not the way we're thinking about it. That when you ask for reappointment, we put you in the whole mix and we look at the field and we make a decision. We make a decision ultimately, I hope, on what we think is best for the, the board as a whole and for the community as a whole. Going back to what Chalini started with at the very beginning of our discussion. So I'm grateful to CRC for what they did. I think they took a real chance. And I think we have an extraordinary opportunity here to do something really important. And also to make a point to people out there in the public that when on these two bodies at least, when you ask for reappointment, we certainly take your service in consideration, but it is not the only thing we're going to look at. Kathy? Um, I just, I just wanna correct something that may have been a misperception on the notion that Michael has shown up and that of course we expect them. He's done so much more. If you really watch the tapes, of the planning board meetings. He's questioning, he has read, he's bringing up topics. There's often really engaged conversations. This, I watched the same thing happen on the Community Participation at, at Committee and where it wasn't uh, digging your heels in. They were very constructive probing questions that led to conversations in a very collegial way. Um, that uh, was so refreshing to see someone thinking outside the box. And when others have said, well, the, the master plan, the plant zoning, being able to explain it, when you watch the interview, he was the one who said what we just heard earlier tonight, that the master plan conceptually is pretty good framework. Where we have work to do is on implementation and that appendix is really pretty interesting. There's a lot of pieces that we should be thinking of. So he's been thinking about where are the nuances, where there are shades of gray, where we're not clear and how does that interact? So it's a very creative mind um, that I was watching. It wasn't just that someone is coming and showing up. And I just wanna say that if I, watch across all committees. This is not true of every committee member. There are some committee members that don't often speak up. Um, they may speak up on narrow things. Um, and, and it depends a lot on how well the meeting is chaired in terms of how people participate. But this is not a person who just shows up. It's, it's so much more. And I, I just was um, really totally impressed on the grasp of a broad range of issues, the things we're talking about, all these different goals. I mean, he really has embraced those um, on a uh, internal level, not just because he's been on these boards, on talking about climate change, space, walkable, livable communities, the, the built space, Jolene, you're talking about that. What does it feel like to live there? What, what does, he walked our new playground land to think of where does, in terms of Kendra Park, where does it slant? Where does it not slant? And where do the walkway? Very thoughtful way of going on a site visit. So I don't think we should at all be saying it's just 
because he's already served this amount of time. He's a, an extraordinarily valuable member of the planning board in, the, in what he contributes. Steve. So we don't know. So again, my concern about the fact that one person has gotten a bunch of letters and we've gotten zero letters because that's not part of the process for the other candidates. We have absolutely no idea if those qualities are true or not true of the other, the three leading candidates. I would imagine, I'm guessing that they are also whatever committees or organizations that they've been part of, they've been active, engaged participants in those. I'm sure that they could get letters written about them that say something very similar. But I am really deeply concerned about this idea that we're willing to jettison one of three people that probably most of us really don't know because they have not been involved. They weren't part of town meeting. They weren't part, they haven't been part of the, the scene. We're willing to throw one of them off the bus because of somebody that is known and somebody that's generated a bunch of letters from people that we also know. That to me seems exceptionally unwelcoming and un exceptionally not progressive. This happened to be a year that there are really great candidates for the planning board and kudos to this town and kudos to those that stepped up for these three slots. It's um, and if there were if there were fewer candidates, then obviously our vote would be different. But this happens to be a very competitive year. Next year might not be a competitive year. We struggled to come up with the while it might have seemed easy, it might have seemed awkward. I think we really struggled to you know come to this particular decision. I hope that we stay with it. And again, really the reason I want to speak up this time is kind of the willingness to toss off a lesser known person who has doesn't have a bunch of letters written about them simply because we don't know much about them and we don't think that the political pushback will be much if they happen to be um, tossed off the bus. Dorothy. Well, I don't wanna talk about tossing off the bus because that's where we started. Um, and you had, I had an interesting conversation with you in which you explained to me that there were many different kinds of architects. And I think that was some very valid points there, but we do know that we have openings coming up um, in a year. And I don't think someone who didn't make it in this rather competitive round, who actually listened to this discussion is gonna to feel tossed off the bus. Um, so I just wanna say one little thing. Um, if diversity of opinion is not allowed, we will never get diversity of any other kind. And I think that's what the issue has been, is that Mr. Burt Whistle has not always agreed in discussion, but as he makes very clear, once a vote is taken and hit the other side has won, he then joins in and supports that vote, okay? So he is an independent mind, but he is a team player. And he's a man of great experience and wisdom. And I don't personally know him. The one time I spoke to him personally, he disagreed with me. So I'm speaking purely out of the many, many, many planning board meetings that I went to over the last two years. And I went to almost all of them. And he was somebody who was of great talent. So I don't want us to lose out on having him on our planning board. And I hope that we will be able to utilize the talents of these other new people because I agree, we're very lucky and we have the planning board is a very key group and we have a lot of major decisions that have to be made. But I think it would run better with if we keep the voice of, of the greatest experience on the board, that will be really a great mix of people, viewpoints, backgrounds and experience. We'd have a good, strong planning board. Evan. Well, unless Mandy has something she really wants to say, I was going to call the question or ask that we, or ask that the president call the question. Okay. Question's been called, requires two thirds vote. That's nine people. The, this comes to an immediate vote and it is um, a vote on whether or not to um, end debate and go on to the actual uh, motions. Okay. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
Um, Lynn, at this point, we have the motion. I, if you could repeat the motion, I would appreciate that. The motion that's on the floor right now is calling the question, which means we end debate. Then I'll get to what the motions are. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Schreiber. This is to call the question, aye. Steinberg. Aye. Schwartz. Yes. No. Yes or no? To call the question, yes. Right? Shalini? Yes. Brewer? Yes. Yandris? Yes. Dumont? Yes. Reesmers, yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Shane? Yes. Okay. That means we come to a vote on the present amended motion. And the amendment is to remove the name of Tom Long and replace it with the name of Michael Burt Whistle. Therefore, the full motion would read to appoint the following individuals to the planning board per charter section 2.9C effective immediately for terms expiring June 30th, 2023. Michael Burt Whistle, Johanna Newman, Andrew McDougall. Uh, the first person to vote this time is Schreiber. I vote no. Steinberg. Yeah. No. Um, um, uh, Schwartz. Yes. Paul Milne. No. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. No. Dumont. Yes. Griesmer abstains. Panicky. No. Pam. Yes. Ross. No. Ryan. No. Shane. Yes. I have seven no's. Um, I have five in favor, seven against, and one abstention. Thank you. Okay, so if, uh, that motion dies. We're back to the original motion. The original motion is Town Council Appointments Planning Board. Um, Planning board uh, to appoint the following individuals to the planning board per charter section 2.9 C effective immediately as recommended by the community resources committee. For terms expiring June 30th, 2023, Johanna Newman, Tom Long, Andrew McDougall. And we begin with The second, right? It was seconded, yes. So if you're voting for this one, it's for the slate that is Johanna Newman, Tom Long, and Andrew McDougall. 
I move to postpone. Okay. Mindy Joe, that does not require a second, correct? Depends on whether it's a motion or her charter right to postpone. Charter. I would just note that that leaves the planning board without enough members to meet for anything regarding a special permit. It's been made to postpone and it's not debatable. Jim? Excuse me, Dorothy, yes. I have a question. Does that mean that Michael Burt Whistle can't, is not still on the co committee? His term so expires at the end. So he's been kicked off is what you're saying. Okay, all right. Michael's term expires at the end of August, as does everybody else who was extended to the end of August. There were three people extended to the end of August. He was one of three. Dorothy, do you have a further question? I can't hear you. I just wanted that clarified because sometimes committee people stay on until the replacements are there. But in this case, you're saying because the terms were extended to August that they can't be extended again and there would be nobody on the planning board almost. Is that right? There are four people. Okay. There's people left on the planning board. Okay. Fiber, good. Your hand up. Can we look at the charter before we go down this path? Because I thought there was something about unless there's an emergency situation or so. Can we look at the charter before we all agree that this is a correct procedure? Andy, Joe, we can line it up. Yep. I mean, I, I have it up. It, it just has to be in a non-emergency measure, which this wouldn't be considered an emergency measure. And it has to be um, prior to or at the call by the presiding officer. So it would meet both of those standards. Pat, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I. I think that Darcy, your action um, was not helpful and shouldn't have happened. Um, if anything, we should have had, tried to uh, defeat the three candidates. So I, I would like you to withdraw the postponement. I don't see the point of it. I really don't. And I think it's a mistake. Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so the planning board this week has on the docket um, a temporary shelter at the survival center and it has on the docket tents for the public schools so if we do not vote tonight the planning board will have four members which because we passed this other bylaw these are special site plan reviews because we passed this other bylaw they do have a quorum if everybody shows up but the fact that you're putting the survival center project and a public school project at risk i find to be disgraceful and I really, I don't believe that we'll have any more new information regarding this um, and the next time we vote and I'm, I am with Pat on this that I think we should just vote this up or down. No new information will come in the next two weeks. The uh, statement by the counselor has been made and uh, it's not debatable. The jury shall disregard my comments. Don't disregard mine. So, move on. Lynn? Yes. I do want to point out that the charter says to the next meeting. And so it is possible if desired to schedule another meeting. It does not have to wait till our next scheduled meeting. It could be a new scheduled meeting. But I would recommend that be discussed with the council. Right. 
uh, let's have that discussion. Next Monday night is Labor is Labor Day, and so we would normally not meet on Labor Day. We could meet on uh, any time, so that I have forty hours to post notice, which means I'd have to. The earliest we could meet would be Thursday, um, and we could meet Thursday. We could meet Friday. We could meet Tuesday. Alyssa. I recommend that we meet Thursday at five o'clock. We have the 530 meeting already. I cannot meet at 530. Well, I mean, I'm saying we have the 530 already. So we do this at five. Because we already I know you ha you are part of the 530 event, but we do that we do a meeting just from five to 530 with this being the only topic or 430 or whatever. I mean, it's all going to be inconvenient for you and Paul, no question, but it is the earliest possible time. And that way, in case something goes wrong with the planning board meeting this week, they can reschedule for something for next week, potentially. I just don't want them to have to wait very long to reschedule if they end up having to reschedule because they don't have a quorum because anything can happen. And we're all planning to be part of this 530 thing on Thursday, right? And TSO was already going to meet at seven o'clock. So that's some of us right there. All right. I would suggest we meet at 430. I'm going can to confirm ask, that everyone can make that. So I will ask each of you, can you make a meeting at 430 on Thursday, the third of September? I will go through the roll call. Sarah. I am so sorry, but I cannot, and I apologize for making this a lot harder. I'm really sorry. I would suggest if the majority, and I'm okay with that because it's my fault that I, I can't change my plans. So I don't want to make this hard. Felony. Yeah, I can make it. Alyssa. Yes. Pat. Yes. Darcy. ECAC has a task group meeting from four to six, but if everyone else can make this, then I will try to make it and not go to that meeting, I guess. Reesmer, I will not go to my other meeting, and yes, I'll be there. Haneke. I can make it. Pam. I have a meeting I'm supposed to be at. It's in preparation for classes opening the next Tuesday. <coughs> Ross. I could make it, yes. Brian. Can make it. Shane. It would be difficult for me to make it. Is that a yes or a no? I I can make it, but I, yeah. Schreiber. Yes. And Steinberg. Yes. So we've got 10 people who definitely can, one for whom it's difficult, and two that are no. I I um I think that I will withdraw the motion then. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We're going back to the vote. The motion that's on the table is to appoint the following individuals to the planning board per charter section 2.9 C effective immediately as recommended by the community resources committee for terms expiring June 30th, 2023. Johanna Newman, Tom Long, Andrew McDougall. Uh, we start this vote with 
Kara Schwartz, I think. Sarah? No. Calony? Yes. Brewer? No. DeAngelis? No. Dumont? No. Griesmer is still abstaining. Panicky. Yes. Pam. No. Ross. Yes. Brian. Yes. Shane. No. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. I have six six with one abstention. You know, I'm tired of getting put in this situation. I'm changing my vote to vote yes. And I'm going to just tell you, I thought this was the most terrible conversation this council has had in our tenure. We have besmirched people's reputations. I mean, I had many things I could say about a number of these candidates, at least two that I know. But I'm not going to sit here and say that. I, I'm, I think we really need to stand back and we need to look at our process. And I want to make a statement I made many, many, many months ago. A committee's process has to be fully and completely understood by the full council so that there's no questions after the fact. I'm sorry. I Let's proceed with the meeting. Okay, we're going on. We're not going to go into executive session until we finish the other items because when we come back out, we're lucky if it's two o'clock in the morning. Um, so, are there any committee reports? Finance committee, Andy. Uh, no, there's no report. We're meeting tomorrow at 2.30. At GOL, George, any report? Briefly, we're meeting Wednesday at 10.30. We'll be meeting with KP Law to discuss their uh, uh, memo on the uh, wage theft bylaw. Right. Kathy, JCPC? JCPC is, mate, is meeting not this week, but the following week at 5.30. And before I say the wrong date, let me make sure I have the right date. Um, Andy will know. The on, ninth. On, on the ninth. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say Wednesday, but I wanted to give the ninth. Okay. Thank you. Town Services and Outreach Committee, Darcy. Yeah, we're uh, the the committee is meeting on Thursday. We moved our our meeting back from six thirty to seven because of the UMass forum, and we'll be devoting the the most of the meeting to the surveillance technology bylaw proposal. Okay. Lynn, you skipped CRC. May I say a few quick I'm things? I'm sorry, I did. I was on the earlier page. Andy Joe. Um, just, just two things. Tomorrow we are discussing the beginnings of goals to put forth in a potential comprehensive housing policy. So if you're into housing and you have time and are awake, um, and would like to attend a two o'clock meeting tomorrow, we will be discussing preliminary potential goals for a policy. We're in the very early stages of trying to draft a comprehensive housing policy. On September 15th at 2 p.m., CRC will have Christine Brestrup and Rob Mora at the meeting to discuss um, priority oh. for zoning bylaw changes. This is the very first meeting. They will be discussing and presenting the bylaw changes that they believe are priorities. They, they will be able to, I believe, be a presentation on uh, planning board 
discussions on what planning board believes are zoning priority changes and I have asked council members to um, get to me their thoughts on zoning priority changes um, by I think I said yes no by next week by the 8th um, so that I can include them enough counselors have indicated that they are interested in this September 15th meeting that I will be working with the president to call it as a full council meeting so that everyone can be involved in the discussion thank you thank you okay um, did I miss any other committees liaison reports any liaison reports um, but the only report I have is that CPA will be having its first meeting of the year of the new season on Thursday, the 10th at 6 p.m. And that's when they will um, be reviewing the amount of money they expect to have for the year and, and starting to issue a for proposals. And I want to just point out that this the CPA is moving their entire process earlier in the year. So that is something that we should make as widely known as possible for people to get their applications in. It's a much different cycle, right? And they, and they have had a subcommittee, I'm just not sure where they are on it. So I'll learn more at the next meeting, talking about how to do better outreach to let people know how to apply if they have an idea, um, you know, if they, including smaller as well as bigger, you know, to get more proposals to come into them. So there has been a committee formed on how, how could they go about doing that? And so at some point I can be reporting on that. Okay, thank you. Any other um, committees? Okay. Uh, We've already done the minutes, town manager's report. Um, just that the polling locations will open in seven, a little bit less than seven hours. So I'm sure you've all voted early, but that's all I had for this, my, my report. Thank you. We look forward to finding out how it all goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you for your report, Paul. Um, are there any other town, town councilor comments at this time? Okay, then under topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance, there is a motion to reconsider zoning bylaw 11.250. Kathy Shane. Um, given, given that it's midnight um, or after midnight, um, I don't think I should keep everyone here, but I, I did want to make sure that people have the graphic that I prepared, Lynn, that the vote we took last time. I, I, as a member of the minority, you can bring a proposal to reconsider. And there was new information. We voted on something that wasn't the same as was what was in Northampton and Springfield. There's a clause that our ours has that says abstaining votes don't count. And I checked Northampton, Springfield. I didn't check many others. Um, they don't have that, and it makes a difference for the way you count. Um, so my understanding, Lynn, is if we don't do anything tonight, it go, the, the thing we voted on two weeks ago goes into effect, and I couldn't bring it last week because it can only be brought at a regular meeting. So that's why it's tagged on to this. Um, okay, so it, yes, it does go into effect. This is the 14 days of posted notice. So... Um, that is, um, and that's the opportunity to bring it forward. So, yes. Okay. okay. So, um, can I, what I would request is since I couldn't send things to people in advance, I produced a graphic that just shows the impact of what we voted on. And I would like to get it in the packet. Maybe we can get it in the packet for next time. So the public also understands that the implication of the change we made, as well as all of us understand it. Um, sure. It, it's okay. like, so, so that's it. I, I didn't know the right way to go about doing that. Okay. I have a point of order, Lynn, a, more of a clarification for Kathy. Yeah. Do you intend to bring a motion to reconsider on this bylaw at our next meeting? She can't. Or are you not intending to bring a motion to reconsider at all? I think I asked 
Let me let me tell you why I ask. Our rules of procedure only allow you to bring it at the next regular council meeting. That is this one. So if you're, I just want to let, I, I just want to make sure you understand that if it is not brought tonight and you're hoping to bring it the next time, you'd have to also get a vote on um, suspending the rules too. I just wanted to make sure you understood all of that before you decide not to make that motion tonight, if you intended to make it at the next meeting. Well, I guess I was understanding from Lynn is that it's already done um, and there's nothing to reconsider if I don't do it tonight, that the clock has run out. I mean, so I'm, and I'm just conscious, you know, I wasn't trying to torture anybody with this. I was trying to make sure people understood what it was they voted on and made it clear because I, both that it was not the same and it was, it, it wasn't identical. It had an additional clause and it makes a difference. And I did ask people whether at the CRC level, it was explained to be the same. And a lot of public I talked to didn't even understand what the implication was. So I just would like it as part of the public record and I can write something up if someone tells me how I can make it part of one of our packets without being outside the um, law. So the answer at this point, uh, Mandy Joe, is no, she does not. Okay. Shalini, you have a question. Um, do you want me to comment? Because I did look up and I didn't see that it was different in the way I understood. I went to the Northampton and the way they define majority vote in, the, in their charter is identical to... It, does, it doesn't have the clause abstaining votes don't count. It says when used in connection with the meeting shall mean a majority of those present and voting unless another uh, votes for simple. Okay, wait, 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 wait. wait. Um, I believe that what you're, the confusion is the following. It's voting is present and voting. And if you abstain, you are not voting. Uh, shall mean a majority of those present and voting. So it's right. a, those present and voting. So that the does not include that, ab abstain people. The fact no. that they don't have that clause only is a clarification. It doesn't mean that they count abstaining or we count or anybody else does. Mm. And voting. When, when I asked for clarification, Mandy said I was correct, that if we had four people in the room, two said yes, one said no, and one abstained, two is the majority. Correct. And that, and because yeah. we're not, we're not, it's not a majority of four, it's a majority of the, uh, so it's because we're not, we're not counting the abstaining vote at all. No one does. It's a majority of the present and the voting. voting. Yeah. Of four people present at the meeting, only three vote. If two vote in favor, it means it passes. But all four voted, just one voted abstain. And, and we abstain is not a vote. Abstain is not a vote. Ah, this is a whole new flavor because we we keep counting, we count 13 of us every time as whether we abstained or voted one way or the other. I think we, it we report so, that we abstain. We don't count that we abstain. So in our charter, let me explain some of that. There are a number of references in our charter that refer to a majority of the full town council. And it's that phrase full town council in our charter that requires seven yes votes no matter what, because that is a majority of the full town council. If okay. it is just a simple majority or a majority of those present and voting, abstains do not count because an abstain is not a vote. But okay. when you reference to majority of the full body or however in our charter, it's full town council, an abstain essentially counts as a no vote because you still need seven yes votes or nine yes votes because of how that is worded in the charter. And for the charter commission, they did that specifically for a number of things. But a majority vote when it's not of the full body, abstains are not a vote in that case. Well. I, I will say that you can explain that and just did it now, but that is not how people generally understand it. A lot of people think four is the majority from what we voted on. So I think we've just made it clear at uh, 17 minutes after midnight that we voted 
something that went from five votes required to not four votes required, but as few as two is enough. That's what we have in fact done. Okay. Okay. So we are going to move into executive session for the purposes of discussing the compensation of the town manager. We will not be returning to regular session so that we will decide tonight and then we will actually vote on the 14th. I just feel like I can't put you all through that. However, we need to have a roll call vote to go into executive session. Do you want me to make the motion? Yeah, could we actually yeah. make the motion, please? Yeah. I move to meet in executive session pursuant to MGL chapter 30A section 21A2 to conduct a strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, town manager Paul Bockelman, and to also conduct negotiations with non-union personnel, town manager Paul Bockelman, and that the council will not reconvene in open session following the executive session. I second that. Okay. And we start with Shalini. Yes. Alyssa. Yes. Pat. Yes. Darcy. Yes. Reesmer. Yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Uh, Evan. Ross. Yes. Sorry about that. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Did I miss anybody? <laughs> Thank you. No. I okay. said yes too. So we are going off of this and will not be reconvening. Paul, at some point, I may contact you to join the meeting. Okay. And you need to look at an email you got from Surge in order to uh, join the uh, executive session, okay? 